Hi there, welcome to the Building Your Tiny House Dream video tutorial series. I'm Chris, I run a company called Tiny Industrial, and along with the book of the same title, I'll be showing you how to build this exact house. So follow along. All right, so to build your own tiny house, first and foremost, you're gonna need a trailer. This is it. This is the new trailer for the video tutorial tiny house build. So what I wanted to do is just walk you around this trailer and let you know why I chose this particular trailer over other trailers. There are a lot of trailers out there. This happens to be a utility trailer. Now these are standard off the shelf things that you can buy at, well, trailer stores, I guess. If you look online, you'll probably find someplace that sells these near to where you are. I happen to buy this sort of in uh, yeah, kind of like out west in the northern part of New Jersey. There's a dealer out there. This particular trailer comes from Quality Trailers, which is an Ohio based company. I've used their trailers before and like them for several reasons. So, I don't know, I guess let's start on this corner here. The trailer as you can see has a pressure treated wood decking. This is great because it saves you from adding that layer to the trailer yourself. These pressure treated, I guess these are, what are these, two by sixes, two by eights, maybe two by eights, are on here already. The trailer apparently has been outside for a little while. Doesn't matter. That's what the flooring is going to get built on, right? Just, just to take a step back, literally and figuratively. The trailer itself is a five foot wide, 10 foot long trailer. Now the trailer has the wood decking and it also has this raised edge here. So this is angle iron, so steel, and it is incredibly strong. And I'd never suggest that you remove this in any way because it actually is part of the structure of the trailer itself. Basically the same angle iron all around, they just sort of configure it, make different shapes. This is like sort of a diagonally placed piece here. The reason I love this stuff is it gives you this beautiful flat surface up here that you can mount stuff to. You can mount stuff to from, from the top, you can mount stuff to it from this side. And some of these trailers you'll find have a like a tube top up here and that's just completely impossible to attach anything to. So avoid that. Look for the angle iron. This trailer is also made out of steel. You will find trailers that are made out of aluminum. I haven't worked with any of the aluminum trailers. I'm a little bit wary of that material. Obviously, uh, aluminum is lighter than steel is, and you can sort of build more on it in terms of uh, weight. Yeah, go, go with the steel. We've got some, some lights on here. There's another one here. These are conventional. These are not LED lights. I've got the reflectors. But let's walk around this way. Here we get to the tire. I go with the large, this is a, uh, a 15 inch, I believe. Yes, 15 inch rim. This is a large scale tire. For a trailer like this, you will also find trailers, the less expensive ones, have much smaller tires. So smaller rims, smaller tires. Those trailers will typically have a lower speed rating in terms of like your ability to take it out on the highway and potentially a lower axle weight rating. So look very carefully at that. This trailer is clearly a single axle trailer and that axle is rated to 3,000 pounds. Now that's total weight. The trailer itself minus the back deck, which I took off, which is that sort of that ramp that people drive their lawnmowers and ATVs and things up to get on this trailer. That's gone, but minus that ramp, which weighs about 100 pounds or so, this trailer probably weighs in at around seven or 800 pounds. So that leaves you about 2,300 pounds of capacity that you can build on top of this. Now, you're probably not gonna need all that capacity, but it's good to have and you definitely don't want to max out uh, the rating on a trailer or an axle because that is just not a good idea. This trailer comes with real nice steel wheel wells. It's got these flares, which I like. Don't ask me why I like them. They don't really serve much of a purpose, but I like them. This is also, you know, very sturdy right here, right? So it's not like, you know, I could sit on that and that's not going to bend. So this, this is great. 
It's also got this outcropping, which I like, which is another incredibly um, sturdy, welded part that could potentially, you know, have a little bit of load uh, bearing down on it. When we get towards the back here, these are the attachments, or rather the uh, clasps that hold that gate in place when it's in the in the, the vertical upright position. Gate is gone. Gate used to be attached to that and to that over there. And there's another one of those claspy things. So the point is, the back gate is gone. Doesn't matter. I could sort of cut this off. I may or may not do that. I don't know. We'll see. I might want to just cut cut it right there and cut it right there. This is going to be really hard to get off of there because it's it's all welded. Let's see what else. Since it's of a certain width, uh, it has this uh, middle light indicator that uh, that's sort of a highway norm indicator that indicates that the trailer is. I think it's more than more than six feet wide. Don't quote me on that. Again, pressure treated to come around this way. Uh, very similar over here, shockingly. License plate mounts right here. Another tire. Okay, so let's get to the front end here. Trailers will all come with one of these things where you can crank the trailer up or down so as to raise the hitching point to, to where you need to connect it on your vehicle, tow vehicle. This is a, a two inch receiver, so you need a two inch ball to tow this. Comes with these chain connectors. It's all very standard. These, these connect to the back of your tow vehicle again. And what you'll do is you'll hook both of these chains up. You know, give them a little bit of a, a twist if they're too loose, because you don't want them dragging on the ground. It'll throw sparks. And if you happen to live in California, that's probably all it takes to start a forest fire these days. So don't do that. Don't be that guy. Yeah, so that's that's the front end. Oh wait, there's one more piece. So all of the this trailer does not have brakes. It is a it does come with this connector though, which powers the lighting on here. So this will do your tail lights. It'll do those those running lights that I pointed out on the corners here. You know, obviously for, for turn signals and all that good stuff as well. So that's what you also need to be able to hook into the back of your car truck because otherwise your trailer will be without brake lights which is not what you want. They usually come with these stickers that list all kinds of information. It'll tell you what kinds of tires and how much tire pressure when it was manufactured. It'll give you the rating on the axle and all that good stuff. And that's pretty much it. So this is always a starting point for me on these gypsy wagon builds. And as we go along here into the sort of the next section of this, the first thing that I do on these is close up all these open areas. So I go once around. It happens to be a two by 12 piece. Let's see if I have a piece of that lying around. So it's uh, pressure treated, but it doesn't matter. Uh, let's see here. So I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Yeah, almost. What you want is you want this to, to line up with the top here. So basically you get a nice flush uh, surface right there. And the, what that does is it closes in the bottom. Now I typically paint the, these pieces black, but who knows, maybe I'll go crazy this time and just stain some wood and, and do it that way for once because I don't like to build the same thing twice. But yeah, that's it. That's step number two. And that will be videoed and documented next. But I wanted to give you a view of the trailer. It's basically all there is to it. All right, so we got all the stuff here that we need to get started on the Gypsy Wagon trailer build. I have purchased plywood. I have purchased two by 12s bunch of 12 foot long two by fours, a couple eight footers. We got the trailer. I think we're ready now. Just to recap, the trailer was $1,350 and I just spent uh, 70 on 
Okay, so with the trailer, the first thing you're going to want to do is level this thing. That's what you need one of these bad boys for. So the level here shows you, you know, where you're at in terms of that. You put this on one of these nice rails, and what you'll see is that this trailer currently is not quite leveled. So how do we do that? Well, we do it with the help of these things. So you got these jack stands. I've got two of these. I'm gonna put those under the back corners over here. And then through the use of the front lifter thingy on the hitch end, I'm going to balance this thing out and you'll see how lovely that is. All right. Okay. So we're gonna get this thing evened out with these, like I said. So these are gonna go into the back. So let me get these back here. Actually what we'll do is we'll lower the front a little bit. Get these under the back. Now make sure you have your trailer in whatever position you want it to be in when you're building. I'm pretty happy with where it is right now. So I am just going to Get these on here. Now, these are gonna take, yeah, these are gonna need a little block of wood, like this. Just kind of goes under there. All right, now what this is doing is you are creating a level surface and you're creating a steady surface. And why is this important? Well, we're gonna be doing some upright work on this, obviously. There's gonna be a back and a front and sides. And if you don't level out the trailer right from the get-go, you run the risk of, you know, building something crooked, basically. I mean, that's, that's the easiest way to say it. And you don't wanna do that. Definitely don't wanna do that. So, let me get these things under here. Uh, that's about right. So we want to level this thing not only lengthwise, but we also want to level it from a sideways perspective. So now that we've got those jack stands under the back, we're going to crank this up. All right, let's see how we're doing over here. That's pretty good, actually. A little bit more. Yeah, another touch. Okay, so we will check that there. That looks good. We'll check this side. That looks perfect. And we'll check it this way. You know what? That's pretty good too. We come up a touch on this side. We'll check up in the back as well. So what we did is when we cranked up the front by the hitch end, what happened was that it deflected towards the back and started putting pressure on these, on these jack stands. Now what that does is it takes weight off of the, the wheels of the, of the trailer. There we go. And then what you do to get well, the, um, the lengthwise balancing is actually pretty easy to do. For me to even this out now, in terms of the horizontal stuff, I'm just raising or lowering one or the other of these jack stands. So, so that's completely evened out. That's fine, that's level. Let's check the front. Yeah, that's pretty darn good. It's a hair off like these 
these angle irons don't necessarily need to be perfectly straight. Let's see how it is over here. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty darn close. So there you have it. So that's balanced out now. And the added benefit is, like I said, it takes weight off of the springs, puts it onto these jack stands. You don't have that level of flex in this thing anymore. Whereas if the jack stands weren't under there, there'd be a lot more bounce in it because it would be bouncing on the uh, leaf springs that the trailer has. Anyway, there you go. That's how you level the trailer, step one. So the next step here is to close in the sides. That's what we got the, uh, the two by 12s for. So we grab one of those. All right, we slide this into place. Now these are 12 footers and we only have a 10 foot trailer here. Drop that in place. Okay, so right away, you can see there's a bit of a problem here. And that this top edge is not flush with this angle iron. What you really want is you want that is not completely flush. That's about mm, like a half inch lower than the top edge. So what we're gonna need to do is we're gonna need to raise this up so that we have one flush wood metal thing here because what's gonna happen is the next two by 12 is gonna go on top of this and come out this way. So if we don't have that flush, then this can't sit on there properly and therefore, uh, yeah, it's not ideal. So what do we have to do? We have to lift this thing to a point where it sits flush. So we're gonna add something underneath here and then we're gonna create this nice flush surface. The way that we're gonna do that is most likely we're gonna send something through the, um, maybe a pressure treated one of these for some scraps through it, create whatever the distance is, probably about a half inch. I'm gonna do that on the table saw. And then that's gonna go underneath here and everything's gonna be hunky-dory. Don't crush my water here. Got the table saw set up to make the initial cut. I set it right here to five eighths. And we're gonna send um, that piece of pressure treated through there to cut one and a half basically by five eighths thick piece that's going to go under that end. Now on this end it gets a little bit trickier because you have this lip here. So that actually raises the board. So since the board is going to end on the lip, this board is going to end on here, you actually need to cover this distance as well. So that actually comes up to closer to an inch. So we're going to cut this end just a hair short of an inch. So what's going to happen is 1 5 8 cut and then one inch that cut, and then we're gonna put it on there again and see where we're at. So that 5 8 piece lying right there was actually pretty darn good, except it's, it's a hair thin. So we're still not really hitting the top of the uh, angle iron. So we're gonna cut it just a, just a touch thicker, maybe three quarters. I'm gonna try a three quarter piece and see how that works out. So that's under there. And then this, actually pretty good. Now we've got a pretty level there. That's pretty close. Uh, let's check it up front. Yeah, when you push down on it a little bit up front here. Yeah, that's that's good. It's definitely good up front. I feel like we're a touch too high in the back. So we may have to come down a little bit back there. Uh, what I could do is shave off a little bit of what we just cut and yeah that should take care of it. I'm still getting this weird wobble in the board so I realized 
when I flipped the thing over that this thing was still on there, so that doesn't help. So make sure that any of these clampy things or whatever are gone. But now we've got a nice flush surface here. It's pretty much there. That runs the entire length of it. Closes in the sides, as you can see. Nice runs back behind the wheel wells here. And that's all gonna get sealed up and taken care of. Um, one thing we are gonna do is we are gonna move this back an inch and a half. That way, the one that closes up the front runs this way. Now, why do we do that? Because when you're driving, all the rain, wind, everything's coming this direction, and it's easier for it to get through something that's in the, in the line of, of, of travel, versus if you go this way, then you have the gap here, the front two by 12 and the, this side one, and therefore you're sealing this up so you're not getting that, that air pressure and all those things and, and you're just creating a better seal. It's just, just the best practice really. All right, so we're back. So we've created a bit of a space here for the front ply. And then this board touches up against that point. And then we were talking about cutting these down. So therefore this piece has to go, but we have to do it in such a manner that plywood will sit on this rail back a little bit. We have to sort of mimic that all the way across. So we said that, you know, the back of this equals sort of where the outside of the ply has to sit. Then we have to go back roughly three quarters of an inch thickness of the plywood. And that takes you to right here where I've already marked this board to be cut. We're gonna do the same exact thing for the other side over there. And then we're gonna cut these down and that will do it. I've decided actually not to paint these black. It's going to be stained with a sealant and I've gone with a, what they call slate gray, semi-transparent sealant. So we'll see what that winds up looking like. Bit of an adventure, but. So anyway, I'm going to cut this board down, do the same thing over there, and then we'll be ready to stain these, these pieces All right, so we're all cut down here on the ends, and next, yeah, we're just gonna um, apply the, the stain sealant to these. And then it gets exciting, because then we gotta do the, uh, the front piece, because that's gonna be on the exterior, and that's gonna need to be stained as well, because it's gonna be facing out that way. So we'll do that. Once we get that piece in, you know, probably have to clamp it or something like that. That's when we'll figure out where and how these are gonna get mounted. Yeah, and then we, we go on from there to put the, uh, the ones on top of here. Anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a cool process and uh, yeah, let's stain these things. That didn't quite turn out the way I wanted it to. That right there is what it looks like. That's supposed to be semi-transparent. Now, that to me is like barely grayed, but this is kind of how it goes sometimes, you know? Like not everything in this build is gonna be perfect. Not everything's gonna turn out exactly how you want it. You just gotta kind of roll with it and expect that the aggregate will look awesome. Anyway, the side pieces are next. What I wanted to mention is what you're gonna to wanna to do is you wanna make sure that there's no writing or blemishes that are gonna show up on this board uh, because it's gonna be facing the outside, right? So if there is sort of writing or something stamped on there, you might wanna sand that off before you put the stain on. Just wanted to mention that.
So this next part is critical. We've got the sides in, well, they're loosely in. We've got the front in, we've got everything stained. Now we're gonna do the front front, the plywood. So this is pretty key. So if you take a look here, we've got, we've got the front end, we've got it set back a little bit so that we can get the uh, plywood in there. And what I did is I just took these two short pieces here to simulate the outcroppings that we're gonna do because these will be instrumental in getting the measurements right. So effectively, we have to measure from all the way down here because that front ply is gonna go uh, into here, into this groove basically. Then we have to measure from the very outer edge to that side, outer edge. That's going to be sort of a, a rectangle down there. And then once we have that, we're going to make a 90 degree turn. That's a drooping a little bit, but imagine that's perfectly flat. We're gonna make a 90 degree turn this way for exactly the measurement of this and to here. And then we need to go vertical from there. So this right here we know is an inch and a half because of the thickness of this board. So that's an inch and a half off of the 11 is nine and a half. So basically it should be nine and a half inches from here to here. You know, this is one of those things where you measure seven times and cut once because if you screw up these sheets of plywood, you're basically gonna screw up two sheets, which is $70 worth of plywood. You don't wanna do that. That's an expensive mistake. Save those for some other point in the build. Yeah, so that's about it. So what we have to do is figure out exactly what that distance is. And then we have to figure out how high we wanna go and at what point we want the, the arch to be there, right? So that's, that's a whole nother thing, but we'll get to that uh, momentarily. For now, I wanna make sure that I get these, these interior or these lower rather dimensions right. We'll sketch those out on the plywood and then we'll figure out how, uh, how we're gonna do the arc. The arc itself is, is, is a little tricky too, since I plan on putting four by eight sheets of aluminum onto the top of this gypsy wagon. Let's lay out these sheets of plywood so that we can start to, to imagine uh, what, what this uh, front piece is gonna look like. And then that is going to be mirrored uh, more or less in the back. Okay, so we've laid two sheets of four by eight plywood down. That creates a perfect eight by eight square. Now, the dimensions of the gypsy wagon are not gonna be eight by eight, so we're gonna use some subset of this. This line may or may not be exactly in the middle. What I'll probably do is I'll presume that one of these sides, like this one, will be one side of the gypsy wagon. And then we'll see, you know, where we have to make that cut to come in from the outer edge and then make that other cut to come down. That's what's next. And this is the thing where you want to spend a little bit of extra time. I remember doing this last time and it was like a lot of, not erasing, but you know, Xing out lines and then trying to figure out which were the ones that I was actually going to cut. Yeah, let's get started with this. It's not completely, it's not completely impossible to do, clearly, because I can do it. So therefore, let's start with the dimensions that we talked about for here. We'll draw that out <coughs> on here, and then we'll take it from there. All right, so this is pretty critical here. We've got nine and a half in from the outer edge from here to where it drops down. So if we assume that this straight edge is, is over here, this straight edge, we gotta come in nine and a half. So I made a mark here that's in nine and a half from the side. Now, 
from the bottom, from the bottom of the trailer up. I'll show you. From down here to the top edge is exactly a foot. So we've got to come and do, hold on, get back here. We've got to come up a foot. This is great to have, nice straight lines. So we've got our nine and a half in from the side, nine and a half in. We're gonna come up a foot. Conveniently, this thing is exactly a foot. So there's, there's our vertical cut. This piece right here is gonna sit in that uh, front part of the trailer. And then it's going to crop out, crop out, come out from there to the outer edge, which is nine and a half. Okay, so let's, let's draw that line as well. And then the whole thing goes vertical. So right here, we already have a corner that we need to cut out. This bottom piece right here is the one that's going to run in the bottom of the front channel of the trailer. And that I've measured to be exactly uh, 59 inches. So we're gonna go from this point where we go start to go vertical. We're gonna go over 59 inches, figure out where that is. And then we're gonna mimic this one foot up, nine and a half over thing that we did here. And that's gonna form the bottom section of the front driver direction hitch end of the gypsy wagon. That's only half the battle, obviously. Then we have to figure out how high we want the walls to be on the side. I'm probably gonna go with four feet. Why is that? Four feet super convenient because you can just slap a piece of plywood onto the side and a piece of plywood like this is exactly four feet when you have it mounted horizontally. So that's, that's easy. That makes life a lot easier than doing, you know, four feet, four inches or similar. And you have to remember that the wall, uh, four feet is from this point. So uh, you go up four feet and what that gets you is four feet plus the uh, one foot uh, that you already have from the floor, floor floor of the gypsy wagon. So you're already at five feet at the outer edges of the gypsy wagon. And then you have the arch creating even more height in the middle of it. All those things uh, lead to, you know, pretty decent amount of interior room. You don't want to go so high either because uh, the higher you build, the heavier it gets, uh, the more wind resistance you have on it. We'll start to think about cutting it out, which is super frightening. Anyway, here we go. All right, I've already run into the first issue here. This line to the outside is actually nine and three quarters in my subsequent measurement of it. Therefore, uh, we're not coming out far enough on this line. Hence, we need to move this over a quarter inch. X this line out. And then the line that I've now made over there is gonna to have to move over a quarter inch as well. Um, and this is kind of how it goes. But um, slow and steady. The only other thing that I've done here, which is pretty intuitive, is uh, cut these top boards. So these are flush with the front of this one. So it effectively is the same length as this board plus an inch and a half because this board and that board need to be uh, squared off at the end, which you will see down here. Ooh, right there. So that's where those two come together. So next step for these, this side of it here is gonna be, the wall's gonna go up here. 
this piece of it is going to be on the inside of the trailer at that point so all we really have to do is protect the underside of this the entire length of the board so the outer edge underside you know we'll be a little generous with it um, but this of course here is all going to be internal and therefore um, will not need to be sealed you can see some of the sealant you know came around this side too this is all going to get painted this is all going to get treated on the inside so not a big deal but this potentially and the underside of it does need to be worked on so uh that's the next step same exact thing happened over there all right so here's what we have so far we've got the bottom oh, this is gonna be real pretty we've got the bottom section that's 59 inches we come up a foot we come out nine and whatever three quarters come up a foot we come out nine and three quarters okay now uh, I said something about going four feet so we're gonna go four feet up and we're gonna go four feet up and where that gets us is to a point where this distance from here to here six feet seven inches 79 inches so this is 79 is that a 79? Yeah, that's kind of a 79, 79 inches. That's how I remember that. So what's left is this arch up here, right? So the gypsy, gypsy wagon arch. Now, ideally you can make this arch flattish. You can make it, you know, more pronounced. The trick though is that we want this, this arch the exact length of this arch. We know that this is 79 inches. We want the length of this arch to be exactly eight feet. Why is that? Because we're using a four by eight foot sheet of aluminum and that's got to drape perfectly across there. So there's a formula for this, but you can figure out effectively um, you know, measuring an arch like this is tricky, but based on where you place sort of the fulcrum, right? Like if you, if you have, if you have a spot here and then you, you stay the same distance from that spot and you draw an arch, you can figure out how far it is from A to B based on the, what is that? The, uh, not the radius, the, you know, that other thing. Um, if you have a circle, right? If you were to draw a complete circle, you could figure that out and you could figure out the distance here. That's what we're gonna do. And then we're gonna draw it accordingly after I educate myself on Google, which is a great resource. And I'm not ashamed to admit it. I use it all the time for all sorts of things. So let me figure this out. And then once I figure it out, I'll explain it to you. Here, this is what we needed to do. The green thing is the roof of the gypsy wagon and the red line is the distance between the walls. So what I needed to know was what is the radius? And the answer is 45.27. So that's the radius. That's what we're gonna utilize here on this sheet of plywood. And that's what's gonna get us the arc that we need. So let's go ahead and do that. It'll all become clear why, why 45.27 is such a key measurement here. Hopefully it's the right measurement, but we're about to find out. So the math problem was, okay, how do, we, how do we create this arc so that it goes exactly from that wall top to this wall top and have that arc be eight feet? Lots of geometry stuff aside, the answer is 45.2. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go from the top of the arc and we're going to know where that is by getting the midpoint of the two walls. 79 inches divided by two is uh, whatever it is. And that's going to be uh, a dot right here. We're going to draw a vertical line. It's going to be parallel to the midpoint here of the two sheets. And what we're going to do is we're just going to draw a straight line down. And then what we're going to do is we're going to put a nail 
into the board that's exactly 45.2 inches from that quarter and 45.2 inches from this quarter. And magically, what should happen is when we put a pencil at the end of that piece of string, it should draw a perfect line. So I got 45 and a quarter measurement here on the string. I put a nail dead center into the uh, top of the arc. How did I know where dead center was? Exactly the middle between that wall and that wall. 79 divided by two gets you to right here. And then I drew a line parallel basically to the boards. This is eight and a half from the edge of the board. Another dot down there, parallel line. That's where we know we need to put the anchor for the string. It's the center of the circle, if you will. And then the 45 and a quarter is the radius. And we start here and the string just keeps us honest in terms of keeping that arc going. The string keeps us honest. That's horrible. But you see what's happening here? It's like a big protractor. And it just automatically traces that arc all the way across. There. There's our arc. Now we have the, the shape. We have the bottom, 59 I believe that was, nine and, a, nine and three quarters out that way, nine and three quarters out this way, up four feet, arc, down four feet, and that's our shape. We're gonna cut this out. I'm reasonably happy with how this looks. So we've got an interior height of, I'm gonna guesstimate six and a half feet roughly. So do what we're about to do, which is cut out the arc and cut out the corners. We're gonna use our friend the jigsaw here. I've got a fairly fine metal blade in there. I'll probably be switching to that blade in there, which is kind of a more a rough edged uh, wood blade. Um, but this will this will make this pretty easy. So I popped that out of there again. That fits really nice into there as we had wanted it to. And we have the front line here again. What I did is when it was in there, I ran a pencil across the bottom edge here and drew this line. So this is basically everything below this is part of this trailer piece here and everything above it is, is what's gonna be visible. So the reason I did that is because we're going to paint this black. I could stain it the same way that everything else down here has been stained. I think I'm gonna to prefer to, to paint this black, make sure that we seal all this up really good because you don't want water getting in there. So we're gonna seal that up. We're gonna seal it up with the black paint. May actually go ahead and, and seal this with the black paint as well. Another place that's going to need to be sealed is this edge here because that's you know the leading, the, the front of the trailer. You're gonna have water hitting this. This is, this is an area that is going to be prone to uh, having water come in. It's ultimately gonna get covered from the outside and there's gonna be a couple of things done with it. But um, this down here, definitely in need of protection. Same thing over here, this, this. Like a dummy, I cut the corner off, I try to glue that back on. And then what we have to do is figure out the location placement of the the uh, the roofing beams. So we've got those 12 foot two by fours that we're running the length of the roof. And what we do is we're going to start dead in the middle. I've still got this line here, which symbolizes the middle of the trailer. So we're going to figure out where that is. We're going to put one right there. When I put one right there, what I mean is we're going to cut out this shape trace it, we're gonna cut it out. There's gonna be a cutout right here and the roofing beam is just gonna slot in there. And then we're gonna use some, some hurricane ties to connect it properly to here. 
there's going to be something connecting it on the front. It's all going to be safe and secure. And then what needs to happen is we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of those. So we've got one, and then we've got room for, we got one there. We got room for three more on each side, so we got to figure out where they get placed, but it's going to be something like, you know, one here, one here, and then one here on the end. And same thing over here. It's going to be like one here, one here, uh, yeah, one here, one here, and one down on the end. And um, that's obviously going to be all measured out and equidistant and so forth. Um, cutouts again same thing it's going to be like that it's going to be like that and then this one's a little anyway we got our four foot wall here this side's perfectly straight because it's the edge of the plywood that side over there is you know as straight as we could make it yeah that's it let's paint this down here and then we'll worry about the the placement of the other things once we have that done once we have the cutouts then it's really just about mimicking it's a little bit different back there because you have that rail that metal rail down at the bottom where you see the, the the stain can back there so you have to lose like a half inch at the end and I don't know for some, whatever reason it's a half inch wider in the back it's 59 and a half versus 59 in the front so little nuances like that you know negate the ability to just simply produce two identical pieces like this Keep in mind too that we're going horizontal with the back in other words instead of two sheets lying together like this we're going to lie two sheets together like that and then cut out roughly the same shape but but yeah the placement of the roofing beams is going to be identical in the back the roofing pieces run nice and parallel from front to back yeah i think that's it for now Okay, so now it's time to do the back of the trailer. So I took the other two sheets of plywood and I put them up on the, the saw horses here. I had to kind of balance it out a little bit. It's a little bit weird because the sheets wouldn't line up. Anyway, I kind of got it lined up. That's pretty tight. I'm just using these clamps to kind of hold it more or less in place. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drop the initial two pieces on top of this. They were vertical. Remember this one's now horizontal for the back. So they're gonna go on top. Yeah, and then we're gonna trace the whole thing out and uh, basically duplicate the front to the back. Alrighty, so I put the front back in. You can see the cutouts on it now sides all that good stuff i cut out the back that is the top section of the back that is the bottom section of the back i sort of test fitted it and it works like a charm back here fits right in between the two uprights on either side that's going to get the door cut into it nice and flush down there at the bottom Everything's looking good in terms of the uh, the lengths of these boards. This is going to get the bolted together shortly. This is the back of that upright seam. Again, we're going to want to seal that really well. Probably run a two by three up the back of that. And similarly in the back, the only way that you're going to get the top section up there is if you start to do the framing, right? So this is kind of a bit of a reverse build in that the front and back are sheathed already, if you can call it that. You know, it's a pretty thick sheathing. Yeah, the only way that the top section is gonna go up there is if I start to frame out the door, and that's typically how I do this. So I decide that the door is gonna be, let's say, 24 inches wide. I run, I find out where center is and I run two uh, corresponding two by fours up, and those are gonna go traverse the bottom board and go into the top board, and then it's basically, you know, you lean the top board onto those uh, two by fours from the other side, and you put a couple screws in it, 
and then you have the back wall in place and then obviously the whole thing gets reinforced you know the the wall sections are going to go in between here lateral reinforcement and then um, the walls are going to come up that's all going to be sheathed so so yeah so it's 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 pretty good let me see if i can get in here in terms of the height i'm a tall guy i'm six foot three and the ceiling is going to be right here so that's going to mean that we have about a, a six foot five six foot six inch and trip six foot five six foot six inch uh ceiling up there so that's what we're looking at and good space in here once those walls go up on the outsides of the these outcroppings it gives you a lot of room in here you know for the bed kitchen's going to go over here and then this is going to be a seating area over in this this section here um, that's how i did it last time i foresee doing something very similar the bed is up on a platform tons of space underneath uh, battery electrical all those things are going to be under here i may want to do a solar panel for this particular build they have these flexible solar panels now next step is to fasten these boards down here onto the trailer which ultimately uh, starts to connect the whole thing together um, the front as well that needs to be fastened this side obviously yeah and then we're just going to start to piece it all together the door you can always cut out right so it's it's not an issue uh, like i said i'm going to frame it out in the back I'm going to attach a top piece once the top piece is on then you can have the rafters start running the length of the trailer so that'll form the 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 top skeleton if you will yeah we're going to wrap the uh, the top in the aluminum sheets and uh, away we go but yeah this this next bit's interesting in the sense that we're going to really adhere everything to the trailer and uh, that's obviously super important because you don't want this thing flying off of there we are now ready to after all the dry fitting that we've done we're now ready to attach these boards to the sides of the trailer and how we're going to do that is um, initially we're going to go through the inside and we're going to do that with a collection of these bolts. So uh, this is a 3 16 I believe, galvanized. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna go through this one and a half inches of wood. This is a two inch. Then we're gonna hammer this in. The round part's gonna go there. And what's left over here on this end, about, about this much of it, it's going to come through the uh, angle iron the hole that we, we are going to drill into the angle iron. And then what we do is we're going to use a, uh, a washer, a split washer around here, put the, uh, the nut on there and tighten that down. Before we do that, so we've got it clamped in place here. We're going to drill all the holes, like I said. And uh, then we're going to put a nice thick bead of silicone in between this board and this angle iron rail. Flip this thing back up there, attach these. Now, in terms of quantity that we're going to use, have 14 of these, and I've got four of these slightly longer ones. So. 14 short ones, four longer ones. The longer ones are gonna be for the front. We're gonna use one, two, three, four in the uh, front there, because in the front, we not only need to go through the um, one and a half inch two by 12, we also have to go through the plywood and then come out through the angle iron. So those need to be longer because of that. So those longer ones are for the front, shorter ones are for the sides. That doesn't mean we're gonna do seven holes into this, seven on the other side, and there's your 14. No, what we're gonna do is we're gonna, gonna do three into this board. And this is not an exact science. I mean, this should be spaced roughly the same places, but we're gonna go in about here, one. We're gonna go in roughly over here, two, because you have to, you 
can't go in here because you've got the, the wheel well is going to be in your way. So you want to make sure that you have access to be able to tighten the nut. So two, and then the third one's going to go right up here, three. That leaves, if you do the math, that leaves four left over for this side. Well, what are those extra four for? The extra four are for when we move this board back up onto here. And then we're going to do one through there, two, three, and four through the top board. And then you're basically adhering not only this board to the frame, but you're adhering the board that's going on top of it to the to the frame as well. This creates you know a, a, a doubly secure uh, and tight bond uh, with the side here. We're going to put some more screws through the top board into this board. Uh, everything here is geared towards this being solid and secure. There's actually one additional step that we'll get to. Um, to pull the board nice and tight to the outside of, of the trailer, but uh, we'll, we'll get that because what happens is, is you can attach this as tight as you want up here. Uh, what sometimes happens is there's like a little bit of a gap formed at the bottom edge of this board. Uh, it doesn't exactly line up with the, um, the trailer framing down there. The board kind of cups in a little bit. So what we want to do is we want to pull that nice and straight I'll show you how to do that uh, in a second, but first let's drill these three holes. Let's silicone this and then attach it. Oh, you also want to make sure that you have it pushed all the way up, that it's up against the, this piece and that the plywood is pushed all the way up because you don't want to be attaching this with a bunch of gaps up here um, because ultimately this piece is still going to slot right in there. And um, so we need to have enough room for that, but no more room than that uh, is, is, is what we want. So, so this is in, in the right spot right now. I'm going to drill those holes, and then we will um, we'll take it from there. Okay, now that we did that on that side, three bolts through the frame, silicone. I used the gray silicone, by the way. I figured it would blend, well I had it, and I figured it would blend with the uh, staining. Eh, not so much. That's okay. Again, we're going to slice away any excess that uh, came out on the outside there. I also shot a couple pictures of the gap. It's most pronounced in the front. We're going to fix that. But otherwise that thing is nice. It's the, the top edge is nice and smooth with the, uh, the angle iron. We're going to do the exact same thing on the, on the other side. No difference to that, except I gotta move some of this stuff away. All right, so other side's getting done. These bolts, these carriage bolts, I don't know if you can see that, but there is a sort of a square, square shape at the back of this dome piece, right? And what happens is, is you drill through. I drilled through with a 3 8 drill, by the way, which gives this enough room to get through there. Uh, plus get through the angle iron, uh, but it's not too loose. And what you want is when you slide this thing through there, you want to hammer home the last bit of it because that seats this, this square shape into the, the wood, into the, the um, two by 12. And what happens then is, is when you're tightening down this nut on the other side, it just pulls itself further and further into the wood and um, you know, it doesn't, doesn't spin or wiggle out of the way. Now if you drill too big of a hole, this little square section up here doesn't get enough chance to sort of grab and you can, you can get a situation where this thing starts spinning. Not the end of the world. Um, you can always get one with a, um, you know, with the, uh, the regular hexagonal, one, two, three, five, pen, pentagon, hexagonal head supplemented for that and then that way you can use a uh, you can use a wrench or whatever to, to tighten this down while holding um, in a vice grip or similar while holding this end of it this is a little hard to grab onto because it's sort of that dome mushroom shape it doesn't work anyway a little little bit of uh, additional information there for you uh, let me wrap up this other side and then uh, we can start thinking about putting the top boards on 
Then we're going to put the front and back ply on, and then we have to start thinking about the door in the back. We're already that far. Isn't that amazing? Hopefully nothing that I've done so far has been difficult other than figuring out that stupid arch at the top of the top of the plywood for the uh, for the curve curvature of the roof. Other than that, yeah, again, this this has been uh, pretty smooth sailing so far. Let's do the other side and then we'll we'll figure out what's next. Okay, so clearly it's gonna be green. One thing I wanna do is get as much coverage as I can on this entire piece of plywood, get it on the sides, because this paint is gonna protect it from water. Uh, it's water resistant. So we're going to, we're gonna to try to get as much on these sides, uh, especially that middle seam between the two panels. One place I'm not getting any paint is in those cutouts, which is fine because I probably still have to modify those cutouts a little bit anyway to properly fit the two x four. So we'll, we'll get those cleaned up and then we'll paint those at the very end, but I am gonna go around and, and um, hit the edges here. And then obviously it needs another coat too. Incidentally, painting, one of my least favorite activities in the whole world. Don't like it, never have. Next step, yes, is this is this is going to be where the plywood slides in, right here, the front piece. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put like some nice thick silicone down here and on the sides. Um, we don't really wanna put it all over this thing because what happens is when this thing slides down, it's just gonna sort of smear the whole thing down to the bottom. We don't want that. So it suffices if we, if we get it sort of around the, the uh, kind of make a U-shape with the silicone here. Then we're gonna slap those pieces in. Oh, the other piece, the other thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna seal up the backs of this thing. Um, bring you around here. We're gonna seal up this area. Probably what we'll do is, the first thing we'll do is we'll pull this piece out. We'll put a nice bit of silicone there. We'll drop this back in and then we'll push it back up against there. So that'll be sealed. Same thing over there. Then we're gonna do what I just described. Then we're gonna drop those pieces in. Then, yeah, everything's fair game after that. Um, we can run the bolts through the front. We can pop um, these pieces onto the sides where they're meant to go. These pieces on the sides where they're meant to go. Yeah, and then we'll do the same thing in the back. We will mount, well, the back clearly is a little bit different. There's no rail basically to slot things into, but the back will attach to, um, to back there. And on, uh, this is a stretch. Anyway, over there, back there will be the bottom half of the back wall. So that's where we're at. There we go, that's better. Okay, now we're ready to drop those things in there. Because they're so light. Especially this one.
So what I'm doing now is I'm um, placing them upright. I've got the spacing done properly on the bottom. Now you don't want them both to go sort of crooked to the side. So what I'm gonna do too is measure from the outer edge to the two by four. Those measurements have to be the same. And then the distance in between them obviously has to remain the same at 26 inches, not just at the bottom, but also uh, at the uh, top end. So once I have all those, once all those measurements correlate, uh, that's how you're gonna know that, that you got them nice and straight. I'm using those clamps back there to hold them in place temporarily. And then once they're in the position I want them to be in, I'll mark them one more time. And then I'll send um, a couple screws through from the other side just to uh, lock them into place. All right, I think that's about got it. You saw me going back and forth, back and forth. It's weird sometimes, you know, you move one side and um, it seems like the other, like how can the other side be off by a quarter inch? Sometimes it's just like a little bit of a, a twist of the thing, but just take your time with it. You know, keep playing around with it until everything matches up. So I'm 23 in from each side till I hit a two by four. Um, and there's 26 inches between the two by fours up top. There's 26 inches between the two by fours at the bottom. That's pretty much it. Um, so now what we're gonna do is we're going to um, send a screw through the, um, the part that I can reach over the top of the wall. And then um, I'm gonna lean something against the bottom piece so that it doesn't move out of the way. Those are both in. It's a little bit hard on that second one to get the screw in. I don't know if you saw it, but it came out on the bottom um, inside of the two by four. That's fine because that's gonna get cut out anyway for the door. Uh, I went over another inch or two. So when you're standing on the other side of that wall, you just kind of look up and see where that top screw is. And then you try to figure out where the bottom one goes. And it's a little dicey. You get the first two in, you're in good shape. Those will definitely hold. And now what we can do is we have those two by fours now to place the uh, top cover, top cover, top piece up there. All right, next up is the drilling of one, two, um, yeah, probably go, since we have the split right there somewhere, um, what I'll do is I'll put one sort of here, one there, bolt that is, one there, and one over in that corner. That way I've got two bolts in each board. That should be good. One of the disadvantages of working with shorts is when you're doing drilling like that, you get like the hot pieces of steel uh, raining down on your leg, causing little micro burns, but that's okay. Um, four holes, we're gonna put the bolts through there and that's that. So next up are the side rails. We talked about this already. 
we've laid this out before already. Um, this is going to go up here. We're going to drill into this so that we hit this four times each side. And that's it. It's no different than any of the other stuff we've been doing. So here we go. level in this direction. I'm not entirely sure if it's level in this direction. It needs to come up a hair on the outside. So this will all even out in the end as we tighten everything up. But as we do it, it's always a good idea to keep it nice and straight. We use these. What is this? Uh, it's called a cedar shim, and what I can do with this is break off the really thin part, and then we're going to get this under here where the tail light is. That's it. Perfect. You can't really see it, but it's perfect. We'll take that back out again later, but when we fasten something, we always want to make sure it fasten it straight. And that's what we're doing. When you get your first hole drilled like that, you want to put one of the bolts through there because when you have that through there, it prevents shifting of the board. When you drill these other holes, what happens is the board might move around a little bit. You don't want that. Drilled through up there, 
put the bolt through there, tightened that down, and that effectively leveled uh, the entire board onto the uh, surface, mounting surface of the trailer. So uh, that's why I did that. And then I did the two middle holes, and I just you know put those in as I went along as well. But um, we've got two sides on now, perfectly leveled. We've got the front on. I mean, I think what's next is to put the back on this thing. And then, uh, and then we start doing the, uh, the roof structure. So, um, yeah, flying along today. Today's a big, big day. Oh, the other thing you saw me doing was, was, was scooping the, um, the shavings off of there. Don't use your hand for that because, uh, because uh, since you're drilling through the, um, the metal, you wind up with these steel shavings. And if you run your hand over those, they'll invariably just go right through your skin. It's kind of like broken glass. So um, that's why I don't use my hand for that. I should be wearing gloves. I should be wearing eye protection. Yes, uh, don't do as I do. Perhaps even hearing protection. Anyway, um, just broke that silicone for this. Uh, why? Probably because we're um, we're coming more in contact with the black metal pieces here and I don't want anything like sort of jarring in terms of um, color. Could go with clear as well but that shows up pretty clearly on uh, black so on this black. So I'm going to use this instead. Apparently my black silicone is a goner. I don't know what happened to it. It's uh, not coming out of there anymore. So let's go with plan B and go with clear. Apparently I've discovered the other bad tube of silicone in the shop. Sometimes Sometimes you leave them lying around and uh, they don't get any better when you, when you leave them. Well, usually try to put a screw into the front of one of these things. So once you're done using it, stick uh, a screw or something in there. And wait until they just clear it. Sometimes there's just an obstruction. Other times, it's just totally gone. That's not good. Anyway, I think I got 
got a couple more lying around. This is a uh, quote unquote fresh tube. But, so anyway, just, just to let you know, just to let you know, these things have a little cutter. You can cut the tip off one of these off of. But that doesn't necessarily, well, it doesn't open it up because you also need to pierce, there's like a foil in there. Um, so these things oftentimes come with this retractable piercer thingy. You just go in there and poke a couple holes in there and then you're good. Fold that back out of the way. Try not to touch the front because it's got stuff on it. Freaking back of this has stuff on it. Um, you pop that sucker in there. Tighten away. Got all over my hands now. Okay. Let's see if this one works. I'm going to run a B on the bottom of that board as well just so that it sits immediately in like a sealed sort of environment for what it's worth. So um, I could run a line along here, but that's probably going to be messier than if I do it the other way around. Put the, um, put the silicone onto the bottom of that board. What we're gonna wanna do immediately, and which it should set up, is um, get the impact driver because we're going to want to drive like one or two screws into this just to hold it in place so that it doesn't fall out um, because without holding it it's going to it's going to jump out of there i'm measuring out the height of the door it's going to go with six feet I'm tending more like an inch or two less than that now just because i don't want to get up too high towards the you know, the crest of the ceiling. So I think I'm gonna go with like either five foot 10, five foot 11, that type of thing. And what we're gonna do is you see the two two by fours behind me here. We're gonna space those exactly in the middle, 26 inches apart. The inner measurement is gonna be 26 inches. I'm gonna go, go up five feet, 10 inches, and then there'll be a uh, piece that goes across those those two uprights. The back has obviously been mounted in there now. We're gonna mount the two by fours to the back. That's gonna leave a piece sticking up and over the top edge back there. That's what we're gonna mount the top piece to. So it'll, it'll, uh, it'll all line up real nice. But yeah, I think five feet, 11 inches is gonna be the, uh, the, uh, the number to go for. Uh, this piece is just lost my pencil. This piece is a 33 inch piece and that is a result of 26 inches door width, three and a half two by four on one side, three and a half two by four on the other side is seven inches, 26 and seven is 33 everyday math. And just untie my shoelace. There's the top of your door. Boom. 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 Pretty big door. Pretty decent sized door. And there's the door. Well, not yet, but we're gonna cut the door out. It's a little bigger than I expected it to be, but I think it's a good size. I think that'll work. What we're gonna do is we're gonna add some windows probably to that end. Uh, here and there. What we're gonna do today is we're gonna cut that back door out because it gets a little bit cumbersome climbing over this, uh, this edge all the time. And that's pretty much the only way in here at the moment. So we're gonna cut that out. There's actually a trick I'll show you. It seems like 
It would be tricky to do because, well, it's a little hard to get in, in close because of the, the two by fours on this side. What we're actually gonna do is we're gonna send a screw through each uh, of the four corners of the door. And what that'll indicate on the other side is uh, it'll create a shape that we're going to uh, put a line on, either by a chalk line or similar. And then what we'll do is we'll take those screws back out, we'll drill one of those corners open, large enough to get a, a jigsaw blade in there. And then we're just gonna cut out the entire shape. It makes it pretty easy uh, to do it that way. And then we have a way in and out. Um, we can reinforce the, uh, the structure there a little bit, a couple more screws. So here we have the door. Like I said, four corners to the door. We're going to send a screw through the corner. screw comes out on the other side it is exactly indicative of where the corner is um, of the door, the top right hand corner I guess, or left hand if you're standing in front of the house. When we do the same thing over here, we do that, we now know the exact top of the door, we know the exact distance. So basically if we, we draw a chalk line in between these two screws as they come out on the other side, we can create a line here. We know exactly where we need to cut to be inside of this two by four and to get rid of this piece right here. Let me make it abundantly clear. Gone, gone, that's what we want. So we've got those two, there's two other corners to the door. So I'm gonna send a screw through on the bottom as well. And I'll show you what it looks like on the other side. All right, so it's a little hard to see back here, but we've got one of the screws coming out right here, and the other one's over here. And then we also have one down there, and one down here. So, perfect rectangle on this side. Now let's sort of sketch, sketch it out. I'm gonna snap some chalk lines and then we'll uh, take another look, all right? Okay, I think that's a little bit clearer now. We've got the rectangular shape all figured out here. I'm gonna take, go back onto the other side. I'm gonna take the screws out and drill one or two holes up there and then we're going to start with the jigsaw on this side and we're going to you know cut the shape out it doesn't have to be perfect on the first pass but these chalk lines and doing it this way really makes it a lot less guesswork it also shows us where we put these screws and they were pretty darn close but yes we're gonna we're gonna um we're gonna Take the screws out again, we don't need them anymore. You can't cut with the screws in there. So anyway, let's do that. Actually, you know, one thing I'm gonna do, you can see remnants of it on here. Uh, if you put painter's tape on the bottom of a, a saw like this, it'll prevent the metal from sort of scratching up your paint job already. It's just a good thing to do. The painter's tape tends to get torn up and messed up pretty quick, but you know, if you redo it a couple times, it's just, it's just less damaging on the paint that you already worked so painstakingly hard to put on there. So um, I'm gonna recover the bottom of this thing before I continue to cut something I thought of right when I started cutting down there. Good idea to uh, to unplug the saw when you're doing this because you don't want to accidentally hit the you know the button. Cut your finger off. Use your fingers. All of them. There, that's more like it. That's gonna just slide better on the uh, paintwork. 
to protect it. Here we go. It's not bad. It's still kind of roughing up the paint a little bit, but get there. down like that is actually more difficult. I'm gonna go up from the bottom again like I did on the other side. Try to hit that right there. Again, it doesn't have to be perfect, but it's, it's pretty darn close, so that's good. Yeah, that actually was pretty good. Pretty close to the edge. All right, so what have I done here? I took this piece off of here. Why? Because, got to admit your own mistakes. I forgot to put some nice construction adhesive on there. Um, just for overall strength of the unit. Pretty easy to fix. There were only about four or five screws holding that in place at the moment. We're gonna slather on some nice, uh, a nice thick coating of construction glue, put it back into place, and the screws that I took out will go right back into the same holes that they were in before. Then we'll repeat the process for this piece and for this piece as well. You do them one at a time, nothing's gonna fall apart, nothing's gonna shift or whatever, so this is an easy correction. Sometimes they're not this easy, but I get a little wrapped up in, in making the video, so it's an oversight on my part. My apologies, this should have been done beforehand. All right, now it gets really exciting because we're gonna put, well, for me, Hopefully for you too. But right now we're gonna put the roofing beams in. Most likely they're not going to fit. A couple things. So we didn't paint the insides of those cutouts for the roofing beams. You know what I'm talking about, the little cutouts up there. We didn't paint them because we couldn't get the roller in there. Plus there's gonna be some cutting that needs to be done. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go around with a scrap piece of two by four. And, and see how that slots into each one of those. And I'm gonna get it so that ideally it's not like wiggling it around in there or loose, but so that it kind of like tightly goes in there just for a little bit of extra adhesion. Then we've got those beautiful 12 foot two by fours and the two two by sixes for the side pieces sitting over there. Yeah, once all those cutouts are ready, for the two by 12s, we're gonna do that. So let me let me go around and, and check the spacing up there. Scrap piece. This piece fit into one of them sort of perfectly, maybe even like a little bit too loose. Doesn't matter, they're all gonna get secured with some hurricane ties. A couple other ones, I marked the spots where uh, we need to, to remove a little bit of the wood. I'm gonna try it with a file first before I resort to power tools. Hopefully that'll, uh, there's not too much missing. If it's just like got a little bit left to get to the, um, you know, to be fully seated in there, that's fine because we can, uh, we can encourage it to go in there with a, a hammer. Like I said, that's what you want. You want a nice tight fit, ideally, for most of them. That was pretty easy. I'm gonna do the same thing on the front. Then I'm gonna paint those interior sections. 
Yeah, then we can slot those things into place. They're going to end flush with the front and they're going to stick out in the back. What we want though is the distance between the front wall and the back wall to be consistent. So what we're gonna do is we're going to measure it sort of at the, the base of the front and the back and we're gonna mimic that at the top of the front and back. And whatever that distance happens to be, we're gonna mark each of the two by fours at a point where we want that two by four to terminate on the inside. Does that make sense? Because otherwise, if you, you could in theory have the wall pushed out like an extra inch over here, have it come in an inch over there, uh, but if they're all marked, then the distance is always the same and you're going to have the front and the back be completely parallel to each other, which is what you want. So uh, let me do the front. Then we're going to paint and then we're going to uh, pop those things in. Now we're going to grab one of them two by fours that's 12 feet long. Slot it in in the front. Bring it all the way to the back. But I think first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure that distance that we're trying to hit um, on the inside that I was talking about before. So that um, when I slot it in, front and back are completely parallel, not like front straight up and the back is pushed out a little bit. You don't want that. You want perfect parallelism. trying to work out the, the two side beams on either side of the uh, gypsy wagon. Those are the ones that we're going to have to cut an angle onto. I don't have any 5 by 6 uh, sorry, 2 by 6 scrap laying around. So what I'm going to do uh, is take one of these leftover pieces that we have filling in the sides over here and I'm going to cut this one or rip it down rather to a uh, two by six width, which is just over five and a half. And what I'm gonna do at that point is I'm going to look to create that, uh, that diagonal cut that needs to take place. And what that'll allow me to do is set up this table saw to make that cut exactly how I want it without sacrificing the, uh, the 12 foot two by sixes in the process. Because if I do it wrong on those, well then I gotta go back out and buy another uh, 12 foot two by six, which is kind of pricey. I forget how much they were, I think in the 10, 12 dollar range. So anyway, it's always good to practice on, on something other than the actual stuff that you're using, unless you're so super confident that you're gonna get it right the first time. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use this, yeah, and then we'll, work on that angle part. So, here we go. Oh, incidentally, I already set this up to be just over five and a half uh, in terms of the distance uh, of the blade to the, um, the barrier over here, the fence. So, uh, it's all set up already. We missed that part. So this piece, now I'm gonna mix a five by six. Let me just double check that. 
Did I say five by six? I meant two by six. And yes, it is that size. So we refocus over here. So now we have a sample piece of two by six. Why do I keep wanting to say five by six? I don't know. It's gonna go here. And what we now need to figure out is how to cut this. One way to figure it out is to simply measure up from the bottom to four foot height on the back side of this piece because that's how we can figure this whole thing so that the bottom of the wall to the top of the wall is going to be exactly four feet. So that's one way I can think of doing it. Once I have that measurement marked on the back of this uh, 2x6, I can set up the blade over there to create a cut that goes effectively from this top right hand corner to where that mark is. So if we can get that right, we'll get the angle right, we'll get the height right, and everything will be just kind of like magic. I think that's how I'm going to approach this. And I have a mark on here. So what we need to do is we go need to go from this corner right here and connect the blade through to this mark. What I can what I can do, which probably makes more sense, is transpose this mark onto the end of the board, which will allow me to, you know, place it here somewhere. And then what I can do is I can uh, draw a line to connect those two dots, and then that should do the trick. All right, so I transpose the mark onto here. Sorry about the background noise. Pressure washer. I move the mark from here to here, and then drew a line from that corner to right there. So that's the part we need to lose right there. So now we're going to try to set up the saw blade to accomplish that feat. I think that's kind of what we're looking for. need a smidge less angle on that, or more angle. Less, more, less angle. Pretty close. So it's a new day, and I have moved the trailer up a little bit in the workshop. What we're gonna do, or what I'm gonna do, this should have been done earlier, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna slice 10 inches 10 inches is going to come off the end of each one of these. It creates a little bit of less of an uh, outcropping, so it comes to, to here at that point. But that's not a big deal because, you know, if you're standing here, you're still, you're still covered with rain or elements. That's roughly what I did on my, my last uh, gypsy wagon build as well. So uh, not a big deal, uh, but now I gotta, I gotta cut 10 inches off the ends. Now that I've marked the, uh, the 10 inch increments, increments, no, not increments, uh, the 10 inches back from the end, I'm going to square that up. These are all 10 inches shorter at this stage. Next thing I'm going to do is I think I'm going to cut a little corner off of the ends of these two um, exterior wall ones, just to give it a little bit of a, a little bit of a visual pop. Beyond that, I'm going to sand these down a little bit because the surface is kind of rough. Um, there's some lettering and writing on some of these. I just want to clean them up a little bit. The, um, the, the cut end is a little bit on the rough side. 
always like to uh, to have a, like sort of a cleaner finished look on it. So um, I'm gonna do that and uh, yeah, we'll pick it up from there. Okay, that's better. We have this expression in, uh, in German, it's called the I eats too. It's more related to cooking and uh, presentation of food that, you know, set out a plate. If it looks nice, it's gonna taste better. I kind of try to apply that a little bit to my work as well. Yeah, I eats too, so that's why I try to, you know, work really hard on the, uh, the just, just the accents and uh, the finishing of the materials. So I think it adds a lot, so um, that's a personal thing. The top side beams are in. They look like this. So we know the top ones were in already. But now I've cut down these to line up the edge of the roof there. And that's going to be the very end of the roof. Then there's gonna be the wall here. So now what we need to do is we need to connect this bottom section up with this top section. So how we're gonna do this is we're gonna run a two by three along here like this, the entire length stood on its side like that. So that's how we're gonna do that. Then what I've done is taken the, the entire distance from that wall to that wall and I marked out the exact middle which is right here. I think it was like the total distance was 117 inches or something, divided by two, it takes you to right here. And then what I started doing is, well, I've, I've ordered three windows for this wall. They're 12 inch by 12 inch windows. And so I want one right here, the middle of the window to be right here. So I had to measure out 12 inches to get to where the uprights are gonna be. And then similarly, that's the middle, that's where I want one window. Then what I did is I went half the distance to that wall, which is where you'd want the second window to be. That turned out to be right here. So, and then again, I went six and a quarter, I believe, inches that way six and a quarter inches that way to make sure these windows are gonna fit. And then I did the same exact thing here from this point, middle point, to that wall, wound up being right there. So that's the third window. So the windows are gonna determine the framing and then what we did from there, or what I did from there was, oh, initially I put these wrong marks in because I was figuring two by fours for the uprights. I'm just gonna use two by threes. So then, you know, that became two and a half inches versus the initial three and a half inches. I'm gonna run the, the two by three, the length of this. And then everywhere you see these lines is where an upright's gonna go. And what we're gonna do is not just kind of guesstimate where that would hit the top, but we're gonna do the exact same, same thing up here and mark out, um, these, these same distances on this top beam. So that way I know when these uprights go in, I know exactly where the bottom of the upright is supposed to be. Even when that gets covered, I'll still uh, be able to see the lines down there. And the same thing for up top. And that'll give us one upright, two uprights, window, third upright, fourth upright, window, fifth upright, Sixth upright, window, seventh upright, eight upright. There's going to be one on the, each side too. So nine and 10, I guess that is. Is that right? Or eight and nine, something like that. So there's gonna be one right here too. 
just for stability's sake. That's going to get mounted into the plywood. And again, that's going to run the, um, the length, or the height rather, of, uh, of the wall. So that'll give us a nice, a nice area to attach the siding to. We can still run wiring through this. So we're gonna do this. So does that make sense, I hope? So next step is to put that bottom one in. Then we should mark out the top in the same way. Once that bottom one is in, we're gonna cut these all to a uniform length so that the, this top beam and this bottom section stay perfectly parallel to each other. We'll also make sure in terms of the distance between this one and that one, that that stays the same because if you don't, what can happen is this one, well, they're pretty thick, but I went with two by fours last time and they tended to flex and bow out a little bit so that I want to avoid at all costs. So I'm gonna just double check and make sure that that distance remains the same. So sorry for the um, shaky handheld shot, but that's where we're at. So next up, running the length. To attach this to here, we're gonna glue it, not like the last time where I had to redo it, but I'm gonna glue this or apply glue onto the bottom. Stick it down here and make sure that this lines up nicely with the edge. And then we're gonna send these three and a half inch screws through from the bottom. Because that goes, that goes almost, that goes about three quarters of the way through the top one. Send it through this way. Yeah, I mean, I suppose that could work too. This is, this is the stronger bond, so we'll go with this one. Uh, send about eight or nine of those through from the bottom, hold everything in place. Yeah, and then like I said before, then it's just about marking out the locations on the top one, adding all the uprights to the studs. So we're gonna do it. Uh, you may have noticed these, this is an eight footer, so it doesn't make it all the way to the end. That's not a big deal. I used another piece down on the end there, and that creates the, uh, the full 10 foot length. All right, so you saw me uh, put those screws in. I went from like this end, down a ways, and then I moved back and forth. Why did I do that? Because you have the ability when it's attached at certain points, you have the ability to still to like pull this out or uh, push it in to get a nice straight line. If you were to just go along and, and just keep doing it, then you're really just attaching this piece of wood with whatever mild or hopefully non-existent curvature it has. So that's the main reason for bouncing around like that. Okay, got this side on, got that side on, perfect. One thing we hadn't done yet was uh, put a bunch of screws back here. Now we do have the bolts connecting it directly to the frame of the trailer for this top outcropping piece. But remember, it sits on top of another 2x12, and that's right underneath there. So in a little ways from here is that vertical 2x12. So we're going to run a bunch of these. Maybe not quite that, that long. These are two and a half and I guess three and a half inch screws. The two and a half are fine because they'll go through the, the one and a half piece of uh, two by 12 and sink by a good inch and a half into the, the underlying upright two by 12. So that's what we're gonna do. Probably gonna do about eight of those on each side. Is it overkill? 
Probably, but I like doing it that way. It's not about any single screw holding this thing together, thankfully. It's about the aggregate of dozens, if not hundreds of screws holding this thing together. So that's how we do it. All right, here we go. All right, that's done. Now, I mentioned this before, but we're gonna mark out the, uh, the top beams to mimic the measurements that we put on the bottom here so that we can properly place these uprights in their respective spots. And then we're going to cut these to length. They're all gonna be the same length. We did it right. And we have a number, I think it's, I don't know, eight or nine per side. We're just gonna cut these quick on the, uh, on the miter saw, pop these into place. These are gonna be a little harder to screw down, so we're probably gonna go on the sides of this, but we'll get to that in a little bit. For now, marking up the top beams. it's impossible to see up there so I'm gonna resort to some sharpie and maybe it'll become a little bit more clear I'll take some pictures as well but yeah the markings line up real nice with the bottom ones you saw me with the water level yeah that works so uh, I'm just gonna highlight those marks up there and then it'll, it'll be more visually clear That's it. Now I'm going to take some uh, close-up video of that so that you can get a better appreciation for uh, for the distances and so forth. Forty and a half is the magic number. I'm not going to cut all those uprights, but I'm going to cut a couple of them. Um, you want them to fit fairly tight. You don't want them to flop around in there, but you also don't want them to be so tight that it pushes the upright or the, the top beam out of the way, um, you know, you can do that. Like you can put so much pressure on it that it warps and twists other uh, things that can get out of the way of that pressure. 40 and a half, slightly on the generous side, seems to be the magic number. I'm gonna cut like three or four like that and then um, we'll slot them in and see how that works. Behind me you see a whole stack of these things, we need 20 of them based on, you know, all the markings, one side, the other side. So I've cut these all down to length and now we're going to be installing them along this wall first and then I'll do the other wall. Should go on just fine. There's, there's going to be ones, you know, here obviously spaced in, but there will also be some here on the ends. We'll just make the whole thing a lot stronger. Anyway, here we go. into the 2x3 already so that I don't have to fiddle with it when it's up there and in position. This way I can just with one hand hold on to the 2x3 and with the other hand drive this home. It's basically poking out of there already. It's right there. So when you have it there it's real easy to just and then it grabs right away. Helpful hint. Let me see.
see me going over this way, I'm cutting these down a little bit. I made them a hair long, which is good, because you'd rather have that than have them be too short. But again, I don't want to power them in there, because it's going to warp and twist that top beam. You don't want to put too much pressure on that. It should be kind of snug, not too snug. Also, when it's snug like that, you don't need to worry so much about putting that screw in there already because it's already being held in place by the top beam and the pressure created, you know, in that space. So yeah, use that more for use that technique more for the uh, the ones that go in a little bit too loose. So it's raining outside, clearly. Remnants of the hurricane coming through. I realized that I need to do the corners. So what I mean by corners is what I will show you here next. So any place like this, where you have two walls effectively coming together at a right angle, you have four corners to this thing, obviously. You have a place where you're going to need to mount a wall onto here. You're going to need to mount a wall onto here. Now this wall is fine because it ends here with this nice flat surface. You could easily mount something to this. But, and I guess you could mount something to this, but you wouldn't want to mount to this because over here is the wall sticks out an inch and a half and you're going to put insulation in here. So what do you mount something to that terminates in this corner, in this wall? Well, you just pop in another 2x3 like this. And then you have a mounting surface here, and you have a mounting surface here. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to put these into all four corners. And that way we have a nice um, inch and a half thick wall here that ends here. And we have an inch and a half thick wall that runs the length of the trailer. That also ends here in this nice tight corner, and that's where the, uh, the walls shall meet. Incidentally, if you're going to have somebody come in and help you with any of this, 
Think about having somebody come in and help you with the roof because it's one of the harder things to do just by yourself because uh, these sheets of uh, aluminum are a little bit hard and unwieldy. You don't want to dent them, crease them, drop them. You don't want to cut your hands. All of those reasons make this kind of more of a two-person job. I don't have that luxury at the moment because uh, most of the people from my previous uh, nine to five office life are in the office right now. So uh, I, I don't have that luxury. So anyway, I'm gonna move, um, you know, it's fine, it works. I'm gonna move uh, the, um, the second sheet into place. You'll kind of like see that happening through here. Okay, not, nothing too terrible about that. What you want to check with the second sheet is on the outside, you'll be able to better see how much overlap you have. So uh, I'm just going to check that. Again, this is all preliminary, but I want to get a rough feel for where everything's going to go before we uh, get serious about mounting stuff in place. So third sheet will go on. I should probably change the camera position for that though, just so you get a different vantage point. These aluminum sheets are not heavy at all. This is a 032 gauge of aluminum, uh, which is about as thin as I would suggest going. My last uh, gypsy wagon build had a 040, which is an 18 gauge, I believe, on it. Um, that was thicker, possibly more preferable. Uh, this is the 32 that I was able to acquire this time around. Uh, the pricing on this is a little bit uh, lower, given that it's thinner. A little bit easier to handle in that sense, because it's lighter, but all three sheets together probably barely weigh, eh, I don't know, what it's, it's probably, I'm gonna say maybe 20 pounds, 25 pounds a sheet. So the entire roof is, is, is well under 100 pounds. So that's, um, that's a benefit. But uh, we've got the three sheets now, they're overlapping. Beautiful, that's what we want. I'm putting them up to try not to like slide it across the other one. I might have done that a little bit. You'll invariably wind up scratching it and as much as you can keep the, the exterior surface clean and uniform, the better. Uh, the aluminum is also really sensitive to like skin oils, fingerprints, any of that stuff uh, is going to leave a mark. I was uh, building the um, was building the other gypsy wagon in the summer, and uh, you know my leg touched the roof at, at various points, and I was wearing shorts, and and just the uh, the sweat and the the, the salt uh, in, in the sweat like left these these marks in the aluminum. So it's a very sensitive material. Anyway, keep that in mind, so 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 as to try to avoid it. Uh, that's about it. Now I'm going to go around the exterior, try to get everything kind of, uh, make sure that the overlaps are uniform, make sure that we have enough roofing uh, material coming up uh, in the front. I'm going to want to have about like a half inch overlap. You'll see in a moment why. Yeah, make sure that it comes down onto the uh, two by sixes properly where, where the angle is. And then we'll, um, we'll start thinking about uh, snapping those chalk lines, getting this all put in place. Okay, now we're up on the scaffolding. I've double checked everything and everything still lines up pretty accurately. So we're ready to put that second hole 
like I said, through the two panels over here, uh, it's where the back panel and middle panel overlap, and then we're gonna do the same thing for the front. So let me give you a little better vantage point here. What we're gonna to wanna to do first is we're going to want to run a chalk line along all of these, uh, these roofing beams. Well, not so much the ones on the uh, either end, but the five that are in between the middle, two on the sides of the middle, and then the, uh, the two on the sides of that. So uh, I'm gonna snap those chalk lines, and then that will indicate where we need to drill through the, uh, the metal plates, so. Okay, now we've got some chalk lines up there. Uh, snap those by doing a little nail in the end of uh, one end of the 2x4, pulling the string tight across, and then lining it up with the other end of the 2x4, making sure it's nice and tight that it's not like drooping, sagging, and then just snapping the line. So. This is where the uh, where the two by fours run. So that makes life a lot easier. And now we can put uh, the the hole up into the uh, section that we were talking about before. And then we're going to do one more over here. So two more holes, two more screws. And at that point, at that point, at that point, at that point, yeah, we're gonna slide these front ones back a little bit. And we're gonna worry about attaching this back piece first. And we're gonna bring the second one on. And, you know, we gotta glue and silicone and, and you know, do all that stuff underneath, so. So yeah, so here we go. A little uh, perilous up here. Uh, you know what, I'm gonna go get my gloves because as soon as I touch this roof, it's gonna leave big handprints on it. Uh, the other advantage of having the, um, the lines on here is that you know that you can, you can put some weight right here because that's where the beam is versus you know putting pressure here, you're gonna wind up denting the, uh, the roof that way. We don't wanna do that. So anyway, let me go get my gloves. Okay, so this is looking good. Nothing's been attached yet. I've got all three aluminum panels up there. The very next, they, and they're straight and they're overlapped properly and they line up to a nice clean edge on the side and it comes over the front about this far, which is what I wanted. It terminates in the back here. These cutoffs, so great. Uh, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put three screws in here. I'm gonna put one screw at the end of this one and I'm going to put one screw through both panels again into that middle uh, roofing beam through the two panels the first two panels and then I'm going to put a third screw into where the second panel gets overlapped by the first panel I guess so if this is third panel middle is second panel first panel is the one up front. One, two, three screws. Why do I do that? Because I want to be able to recreate the positioning of these and the way to do that is, is to put a screw through there because there will be a hole in very late uh, through the aluminum and that hole will line up with a hole in the roofing beam and once we have everything lined up we can, we can recreate the positioning that we have currently. This is a couple things we're gonna to need to do. Like I said before, we're gonna snap some chalk lines on here and we're gonna figure out, yeah, where we're gonna uh, wanna put the screws. Let me just show you those. So the screws that we're gonna use are these. This is a uh, roofing screw, shockingly. And the way that it works is, it's like a regular screw. It's got a uh, hexagon, hexagonal head but the key thing here is this little rubber gasket. Now, I don't know if the camera's gonna focus in on that. I'll provide a picture if it doesn't. But it's got this little washer, integrated washer with a rubber, like sort of grommet behind it. And what happens is, is when you screw this in, 
it goes in and then the grommet hits, you know, if you get to the end of the screw and the grommet hits the metal and kind of compresses and that compression is what creates a moisture barrier. So it, it, it pushes this thing together. Now you don't want to over tighten these because that rubber ring will develop cracks and, and, and water will get in that way. You also don't want to make it too loose because water will just you know, creep underneath it. So there's a, there's a little bit of a, a finesse with these, but if you put these in right, these will, these will never go bad on you. Well, eventually everything goes bad, but uh, they'll last for a long time. Yeah, that's what they look like. Anyway, so three of these to begin with. We have to pre-drill this, because uh, these are not self-tapping. So we have to pre-drill those three holes. Then we're gonna sink three of these screws in there. And then we're uh, then we're on to the next steps. The first one is in. As we do the other two, we want to make sure everything's still in alignment, nothing's shifted, and so on. So uh, now I'm going to go around to the other side. You may have seen this already, but I have some scaffolding over there. There's other ways to do this. The scaffolding is the easiest thing for me, especially here in the workshop. Um, I borrow that scaffolding off of somebody. It's not terribly expensive to buy. I would suggest that you look around and, and, and try to find some of that. You can also kind of create scaffolding if you have two ladders. I'm sure you could uh, find a, a second ladder to borrow. You can, um, you know, you can bridge ladders with uh, some, some, uh, 2x12s are similar and, and create scaffolding that way. But yeah, this is one of the, the harder aspects of the build because you do have to get up there and you know all this is although this isn't a huge structure, uh, it is rather high up there and you need to work, be able to work up there. So uh, so the scaffolding is what I use. The reason I put that dot there is that was that's where the chalk line ends. Meaning that when we put the chalk line on there, the, uh, this piece was slid up right to that point. We'll do the same thing on the other side with that particular line. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna lift this piece up and over this bead of silicone, drop it down, and then we're gonna continue the bead of silicone uh, by lifting up on the piece and uh, running it for the length, the, the remaining length here. We're actually gonna do that right now for the part that I just did over on the left here because it's going to be harder to lift once this piece is on top of this piece so this whole thing is a little bit fraught and perilous made doubly intensively hard by working closely under the ceiling which is hot and working solo does not make this job any easier either so all those things kind of are compounded here but just to check, there was that hole that we drilled right there. That is still perfectly lined up with where it needs to be. And so that's a good sign. We're gonna do the Sharpie mark on the other side. Slide the plate in place. Here we go. Over here, I've just got a ladder. So, balancing on that. What's I gonna do? Oh, I already have the. Uh, yeah, the silicone over here. Don't so much need that, but I do need that mark right where the dust ends or starts, depending on how you look at it. So now that piece goes over there. But first, we're going to put some more silicone on, on that edge. Okay, everything lines up. You got these dots lining up. Everything looks good. We fasten it. I like that. This is hard work. Now we're in a pretty good position. We can put the remaining silicone in there. 
Then we're gonna drill roughly equally spaced holes into the two by fours through the metal. And then we're just gonna send a bunch of screws through there. And then that is it. Then the roof is on, so that's pretty exciting. Lift this up and get to where the silicone is. Just continue that bead all the way down. There we go. Got some good seal in there. This is weatherproof, freeze proof, crack proof, shrink proof, waterproof, permanently waterproof. 30 minute rain ready, it's not gonna rain in here unless I start sweating on it. Mold free protection, wet or dry surfaces. This is, this is the good stuff. All right, let me go do that on the other side. Then we'll start with the uh, drilling of all the various holes that we need. All right, so we've already got a bunch of screws in here. Now, this part still needs to be drilled and screws need to be put in. So that's what I'll do. I'm spacing these out. I'm not measuring it. I'm eyeballing it. They're about mm, 11 inches apart. And uh, I'm drilling through the metal until I hit the wood. And then I stop, I drill the next hole. And so on. I can only do one side at a time. Okay, there we go. So now that we got those those holes holes drilled, we can put these screws in there with the little rubber gasket. You want to clear the area of kind of like the uh, the metal shavings because because they can get under the rubber grommet and deteriorate it or lead to some leakage. And we don't want to over tighten them. If you're just starting out, I actually recommend sort of like a, how, how do I explain this? But if you have sort of a, um, a bubble in here or a buckle, and when you tighten these down, sometimes you can make that more pronounced by, by the tightening of the metal. So be aware of that. Try to have everything be laying nice and flat. And I glued, you know, the underside of these. So everything should be attaching to Roofing beams real nice. So that's three rows. How many did I put in here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Thirteen per row. So we got 39 screws in on this side. And we got another 26 on the other side. So about 60. 60, 70 screws on the upper portion. And then there's still the edge of the roof, which is uh, still dangling in the, in the, in the, in the air. But we're gonna attach that a little bit differently. But getting this all put together is good. The silicone seals are in here so that water can't track back into those, um, those channels. The overlap is pretty sufficient. Yeah, and that's about it. We're gonna um, we're gonna go to the other side. So I gotta move the scaffolding over there, which is no no small task because the wheels are locked up on this particular piece. 
we'll do the other side, but then the roof is done, which is good. All right, so we got the scaffolding on the other side. We're gonna do the holes up to about over here. So I can't reach them anymore. I'm gonna move the scaffolding up a little bit more. When we'll put the screws in here, you'll get a good view of me doing that. I'll try not to slam my head into this beam up here too much, too often. Here we go. The top one's already done, so that's helpful. All right, so this is slightly more clean RV window. I bought this on eBay and I use these for the front of the gypsy wagon. And the reason is for, well, there's a couple of reasons. So it's a used RV window, a couple of benefits. The glass is tinted, you can view that as a benefit or not. The glass is tempered, that's definitely a benefit. It's gonna go in the front uh, drive direction, drive facing direction of the gypsy. So it's gonna be sort of above the bed on the opposite end from the door. And I like to get these because this is a, a window that's designed not only to be opened, which happens like that. And you got the screen over here. Some of them, some of these windows that you find on eBay don't have the screens. I would always go for one that has a screen because otherwise you can't get that cross ventilation without letting the bugs in. So it's got that, great. The other thing it has and does is it serves as an emergency exit. So um, these latches here, they unlatch. And then, and then the whole window folds out. So then you have push the whole window out, climb out, and it becomes an emergency exit. That is something that I would suggest everybody has in their gypsy wagon. So if you look at the door, I'm sure that's a way to get out. But what if for whatever reason you can't get out via the door, then you need a second way to get out and the small 12 by 12 side windows that I'm going to be putting into this will not be suitable for that. So therefore, I like to have a second way out and this is it. So it kind of um, has to meet those, those three purposes. It has to be, well, a window. You have to be able to open it in terms of having a screen and some cross ventilation. Third reason is that it serves as an emergency exit. So those, those are the criteria. They're not terribly expensive. Uh, it is going to be the most expensive window in the gypsy wagon, but you know, you can pick them up for, uh, for about, well, under a hundred dollars. The problem is, is that they cost a, a good amount of money to ship. So if you're lucky enough to find one of these locally or someplace where you can drive and pick it up, great. If not, then uh, be prepared to pay 50 or 60 bucks to have it shipped to you. All in, this window was like a hundred and 2535 I think not terrible not great not terrible yeah that's what's gonna go on the front so the way that we do that is uh, it has a lip that is smaller on the inside and larger on the outside so what I wind up doing is I'll hold it this up to the front of the gypsy wagon and then I will usually I'll brace it on the bottom with a couple uh, pieces of um, you know, two by threes or something like that just because it's hard to hold and trace at the same time. Again, working solo. Um, and you, what you wanna do is you wanna trace this, this, outer, this outer, well, the inner edge, basically. You wanna trace this onto the front of the gypsy wagon, obviously centered, leveled, all that stuff. And once you do that, you have what you need to cut out. You cut that out. If you do it right, you can push this whole window in and then this outer lip, which is larger than the inner, still covers up you know, where you cut and you can put silicone and, and sealant in there. And then uh, that forms a nice tight bond against the exterior of the gypsy wagon. 
creates that seal that you're looking for. Now some of these windows will have some imperfections in them. I don't know if you can see that, but there's a bit of a dent in there. So I'm gonna to try to flatten that out as best as I can. This is aluminum. Yeah, because you want it to sit flush on the on the wall. Otherwise you're gonna create gaps and you know that'll be bad in terms of moisture and water getting in and so forth. So you don't want that. So yeah, so we're gonna cut this next, center it, take our time with, with figuring out where we need to cut, and then we're gonna do that. And hopefully this will pop right in. Again, in a, bit of, in a little bit of a reversal, well, once we have that shape cut out, once this drops into that cutout, we have this lip. What we're gonna do is we're gonna frame up the back of this. So we're gonna surround the part that winds up on the inside with some two by three. Uh, that we're going to mount again to the to the uh, exterior surface there on the inside though what we will do at that point is have a surface or have have something that screws can actually bite into so if we drill through this outer lip and we put you know let's say eight or nine screws through this outer lip those screws will go through the the front plywood but we want we want them to hold a little bit more than that we want to give the window a little bit more support than that so what we want is for those screws to actually go into like a two by three and grab in there. So hence the framing of the window. This construction process is a little bit backwards, just like we put the, uh, the sheathing on uh, the front and the back. Now we're going to uh, drop in the window and then we're gonna frame out the window. Normally it'd be the other way around. You'd put, do the framing, you'd have the rough opening for the window and then you'd put on the sheathing. This is actually done in reverse. So we start with the sheathing we do the cutout for the window, then we know how we, we need to frame the window. And that's just how this is done, because that makes more sense. I didn't have this window when I first started this build. I only have it now. So that way you're not hindered or held up or don't need to have all the pieces necessarily. For the side windows, I did have to know that they were gonna be 12 by 12s, and they are, and so I left um, relevant spacing in the framing of the side of the gypsy wagon and those will hopefully fit right in. Anyway, a little bit about RV windows. All right, I'm ready to add in the window in the front here and I have it set up. What I did is I marked the, the exact middle of the wall because you want the window in the middle most likely. And then I created this uh, this small prop, which effectively raises the window up off of this lip, right in the middle. The window itself conveniently has uh, this middle bar that runs down the middle of the window. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna lift it into place. I've got the, the level on top of the window, and what that'll show me is, is the window level. The upright piece will show me is the window in the middle, and then once it's level and in the middle, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a pencil and I'm gonna go around the exterior of the window here as best I can to try to delineate where the cutout needs to be. Once I have that, I'll double check the measurements one more time from the sides. I won't be able to draw that line where the level is up top, so I'll probably connect that line and just you know, make sure that the outline is fully there. And once, once that's in place, and once I'm happy that it's in the middle and centered and level and everything, I can start thinking about cutting that shape out. That's the process, that's where we're at, and that's what's gonna happen next. Okay, so I have sort of a rough sketch of the window. It's a little bit tough because well, it's hard to get that angle right. Some of the window kind of sticks out a little bit. So the lines aren't exact, and this is gonna be one of those things where you're gonna to wanna to cut sort of conservatively, see where you're still missing stuff, and then you know cut a second time, check it again, until the window finally fits in there. Because the last thing you wanna do is cut too large of a hole and have you know gaps that extend beyond the outer edge where it's going to be impossible to fix this. So that's where we're at. I'm going to take some pictures of this. 
this should give me a, a, a general idea and, and like I said I'm going to measure you know, from the side of the line that I made to the, um, to the edge here, do the same on the other side, you know, top and bottom and all that stuff and make sure everything's centered. Alright, so I'm happy with the way the line looks. Measurements are, you know, make sense in terms of distance from edge and so forth. Centered, leveled, you know, the, the line, there's, a, you know, I went around it with a pencil a couple times. I'm going to go with the innermost line as the first cut. That will allow for the subsequent cuts to expand on this if need be based on how you know the fitting of it goes. Next up we're going to drill a hole through here to get the, uh, the jigsaw started. And now we're just going to go around and cut this out. not to break the window during this whole process. That's it. I've sanded this out a little bit. It's had a really rough edge. Well, it still does. So it's been sanded. What I'm going to do next is apply a really nice thick coat of the uh, green paint because we have a lot of exposed plywood again that we don't want to have be exposed. So I'm going to soak and saturate that as best I can to seal it. Once that's done and dry, we can uh, think about popping this window in. As I said uh, previously, what's going to happen is once the window is in, we're going to do some framing on the back side of this so that when we drill through the frame of the window that the uh, screws go into something. So this is going to have, uh, you know, imagine this is a 2x3, it's not, but the 2x3 is going to go kind of back in here or more visually like back in there and then you have a frame to this window, lends more support. We need to uh, shore this part too. There's going to be something that goes on the back of that to close up that seam. Same thing down here on the bottom. Because if you remember, we had uh, two sheets of plywood that are connected vertically here. So 
But yes, paint, seal up those things, window in, probably hold it in place with like one screw. Then we're gonna frame out the back side of this. It got hot all of a sudden. Whew. All right, it's front window time. We'll bring the camera around there in a second. The cutout is there. We're gonna do a nice thick uh, border of silicone around the edge. The edge of the cutout where the window's gonna go so that we're sealing that, that complete edge. And then we're probably gonna do an edge along the frame of the window itself. So in other words, we we'll put some silicone on the actual trailer. I'm gonna put some onto the window, sort of slightly different areas. And then I'm gonna slot the window into place and uh, bolt it into position with one or two screws. Make sure everything's straight, make sure everything's good. And then I'm gonna to continue to drill the, the, uh, the other couple holes through the frame. But uh, as we discussed before, once that's in there, we need to do the, the back framing of it. So I didn't really get any good video of the framing of the uh, front window on the interior, but here in this clip, you can see how it's framed out in the two by threes. That gives you a mounting surface uh, for the screws to attach into from the exterior. Corners are rounded, so you can have that little gap there, but that's how it looks. While the paint dries, we're gonna do a couple other things here that have to do with this wall. So we're gonna close this wall up soon enough, but easier while the wall is open like this to run some of the wiring already. So again, you have to think kind of like three steps ahead to make your life easier. Now in this space here, this is going to be all bed. 53 inches is going to come up to about here. So underneath the bed is where the electrical is going to be. We're going to drill through that wall down there and put the panel down there. But from the panel, the wire has to run. So what I've decided is three outlets. We're gonna do one outlet here, very close to the panel. That's going to have its own direct electrical supply. So that's gonna sit right here, sort of on the side of the bed. Then we're going to go through these studs right here. We're gonna go through this back wall. There's gonna be an outlet right back here. And we're going to run a wire across the top here and we're going to go out through that wall and then uh, kind of like a third into that other side is going to be a third outlet. So three, three power outlets, potentially one here on the exterior as well, kind of low down at the end of the trailer. We'll see, but definitely the, the, the three interior ones that I just mentioned. This one's going to be a separate direct hookup and then the two other outlets are going to be on the same line. So instead of putting three outlets on one circuit, I really don't want to do that. The panel's going to have at least room for two circuit breakers. So we're going to run uh, two, two separate circuits. One of them is going to terminate almost immediately right here and the other one will contain the two outlets. One of the outlets is gonna be next to the door because that leaves open the potential for putting an air conditioner into that back wall. That's something you want. You can retrofit this to include an air conditioner and hence you're gonna want uh, an outlet there to be able to power that air conditioner. So yeah, so that's about it. So what we're gonna do, like I said, we're gonna drill through these. This is the wire that we're gonna be using. So we need to drill a hole that's big enough for this wire to go through. I think this one should do it. This is, what is this size? I don't know. Probably like a three eighths or something. Okay, I'm gonna do that. All right, that's it. It's pretty easy. Just a couple holes through the bottom piece there. What we're also gonna do is we're gonna have we're gonna have dual electric in this structure. So we're gonna have the 110 volt 
AC power, I'm going to have a 12 volt DC. So what we're going to do is we're going to run a separate DC line. We use for that is we're going to run this wire. It's a thinner sort of um, speaker, 16 gauge wire that we're going to run for the 12 volt system. So we're going to run that sort of in parallel to this other one. I'm going to run that through there. That in turn is going to go to a switch over by the door. It's going to feed uh, lights that are integrated above the bed as reading lights. Yeah, it's going to be for the, for the ceiling lighting. And that's pretty much it. Oh, probably like a USB charging port, maybe over in the kitchen area. TBD. But so that's another thing that we need to run a wire for. Uh, but other than that, that's about it. The thing I want to show you is how I'm going to do this thing down here on the end. Okay, so here is where the wire is going to go through, and that's fine, except we need to go make this turn, and there's no room for the wall and the wire to be in that same place. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to notch this out, provide sort of a channel for this to go through. Now I could try to drill this, but I don't think that's going to be highly successful. Then you're going to have trouble making this turn once you get to the end. So just, you know, creating a little bit of a channel here is going to resolve that issue. Okay, so enter the oscillating tool. This is one of my personal favorites for situations like this because there's just, there come those times when you're just faced with like, mm, how am I going to do this? And more often than not, this oscillating tool is the answer. Now, can you build a tiny house without this tool? Absolutely you can. It is not a requirement. But how it works is when you turn this thing on, this blade here will vibrate back and forth very quickly. And that vibration moves these, this, this saw blade edge up and down very quick. And whatever you touch that saw blade to will be sawn away. So, so that's what this is used for. And that's highly useful for this type of cut where we're looking to just create sort of a channel. You could use a chisel for this. Certainly could do that. That would probably be my, my second choice. But uh, my primary choice is this. Here we go. And there is a great example of why having the right tool makes the job a lot easier. So now, now it's going to be dead simple to make this turn and to find a home for this wire. So the wire will reside right in there. That is completely flush with the exterior. So the wall can go uh, up against that. So they sell these plates where you can put a plate over this. It's a metal plate, which will avoid you inadvertently running a screw through here because you definitely don't want to do that. You also don't want to shoot a nail or anything like that through there. So I may add that. Uh, do I have one of those lying around? Mm, let me see. You do. So what I would suggest doing here is just adding in a plate like this, maybe on a bit of an angle, and that just helps protect that wire from any kind of exterior intrusion into it. But that's how we're going to do that. So oscillating tool did a great job of that. Okay, so I'm jumping way ahead here for illustrative purposes because basically once you run all those wires that you're going to need, you're going to leave them alone until you get to this stage. Now we've got a lot of the, uh, the wiring which originates uh, under the bed. We've got a battery that needs a home. What I'm thinking of for the battery 
is that the battery goes all the way back here into the corner, back there, and then gets you know secured into that spot. And the electrical panel, which we're working our way up to, will either sit down here, yeah, unclear, or it'll it'll go up right next to the bed up here, it's sort of be integrated into a kind of piece of furniture or similar. So that's that's the plan. Odds are it's it's gonna go up here on this ledge. That's that's my current thinking. It's just a better place for it in terms of access to these wires and running those wires. And and it's easier to, to kind of like hide it back in here and, and, and have it just be situated there. So so that's that's another thought. Today we're gonna cover the sides of this thing. I've purchased a couple sheets of plywood. Those plywood pieces are going to go on, so there's three pieces. Two of them are gonna go on hold because we've got four feet here, and we've definitely got eight feet. We've got more than eight feet. And what's left over is going to come out of the third sheet. So we're gonna cut up the third sheet. But first, yeah, the first two fully painted sheets will go on, and then we're gonna finish up. Close again, probably it's eh, maybe another 24 inches or so gap with the third sheet. We're gonna line up the straight edge of the entire sheet with the straight edge of the sheet that we're gonna cut. So we're gonna put the cut end on the actual end. Yeah, that's basically it. What else? Nothing. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna paint two of these sheets completely and then I'm gonna figure out how to cut the third and final sheet. And once that's cut, that two will get painted. Once that paint is dry, We'll be ready to go. In the interim, we'll put in the front window and we'll drill another set of holes here for the, for the low voltage uh, system that we've been talking about. So that's where we're at and that's what we're going to do. Sure you get the edges really good too because that's the uh, that's the point of entry for easiest point of entry for uh, for water so seal it up as best as you can you know it's not it's not perfect this paint does a really good job of coating and soaking in and, and sealing as best as it can but you know you have to sort of aim for 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 good here because it's it's not going to be perfect but yeah there you go at the edges. All the edges. The two painted sheets are going to go from the back towards the front. They're going to make it to right here. That's eight feet from the back to get you to here. This piece we're going to need to cut out of that piece of plywood behind. In fact, we're gonna need one for this side, one for that side. So this magic measurement right here is 22 and three quarter inches. So we're gonna cut one end off of the top and one end off the bottom. Why? Because that guarantees you at least one straight edge and you want that straight edge to butt up against the other straight edge from the full piece of plywood. So you have two straight edges, uh, factory cut edges, if you will, coming up against each other here. That'll provide the tightest possible seam. So 22 and three quarters, twice off of that piece of plywood. And as soon as we've done that, we're going to paint those just like we did with the other two pieces. It's a first coat, we're gonna need a second and third coat most likely. Nice thick saturation on the, um, on the ply. And once we have that, then we effectively have uh, both sides. The sides are going to go on. They're going to start here at the bottom of the trailer. They're going to come up to about here, right where this cut starts to happen. And then when we pull the roof down on that, that's magically going to create sort of a yeah, point here where roof meets plywood. 
And then to protect that, we're going to run that strip of uh, hand, but we're going to run that strip of uh, cedar wood along here to, to effectively create sort of a, a, a gutter at the edge of the roof. So that's where we're at. 22 and 3 quarters, need two cuts of that. That's going to get painted. Then I'm going to run out of paint, unfortunately. I'm going to need a second gallon. And yeah, that's, that's going to get me to a good spot. So now we're ready to put uh, ply up on the side here. We have it painted and we're putting the full sheets up. The issue is a four by eight sheet of plywood is super heavy and really difficult to try to get into place uh, by yourself. You basically have to hold it up against here. There's glue involved, it's slipping and sliding, and then you have to get a screw through there, a mounted uh, into onto you know, the, the studs in the top part of this wall. So that's not really feasible. So you know you think about ways to, to get around that. And what I've done is I've installed temporarily two little scrap pieces. And those two pieces are what the 4x8 sheet is going to rest on briefly while I attach it to this wall. Then they'll no longer be needed. We'll take them off and that's it. Now, part of the nuance of this was that the 4x8 sheet actually is going from a part you know, up here to actually a half inch beyond the end of this. That's just kind of how it worked out. So we needed a half inch gap here. So I, what I did is I placed a, uh, another small piece of scrap in there to create this half inch gap that I can kind of slide my finger in. See that? So that same is done on that back one. And that gives us the half inch drop that we need. If I had just attached this scrap piece straight to the bottom, there'd be no drop. So that's, that's why I did that. Yeah, this wall's ready to go on, so it's kind of a little bit frightening, but uh, yeah, I ran the, the low voltage wire as well, as you can see that, much in the same way that I ran the, uh, the AC wires. That's all in place. Uh, it goes around the corner back there, so that's all good. Uh, now it's really just down to putting a bunch of adhesive on this wall, just for, uh, for, for more strength. The eight foot piece is gonna terminate right up here. So we're going to put glue wherever it's gonna be needed for this particular piece. And then we're gonna set about uh, painting the, the remaining two pieces that are gonna go into the front. And then of course this roof is gonna to start to come down onto the top and then we have to figure out how we close up and seal that part off. But, and then the windows have to go in. And anyway, kind of crunch time, it's Thursday afternoon at 2.30. I've got a couple more hours to, to work on this here today, but then I've got a, uh, a, a show to go to this weekend, so uh, it needs to be ready to travel by around this time tomorrow. So uh, a little bit of work left to do. Anyway, the side's going on. Alright, that's it. It wasn't too bad. One mistake I made, or if you're wondering rather, how I magically hit all those, those uh, vertical um, studs, I kind of cheated a little bit. I should have done this beforehand, but what I wound up doing is from the inside, I went and reached over the wall and put a little green dot everywhere where there's an upright. Like I said, I should have marked those spots beforehand because otherwise what you don't want to do is you don't want to just randomly start drilling or putting screws through this wall. 
if they're not going to wind up in one of these bad boys. So, like I said, something I should have done beforehand, should have marked these spots with a Sharpie or, uh, by these spots, I mean these spots uh, with a Sharpie. Uh, I'll, do, I'll do that on the other side. I realized that once I'd already sort of propped this thing on here and, and put that first screw through, it was a little too late to be doing that. So the beauty of it is, is when you put, you know, a, an array of screws through this, the screws pull the, the, the board onto the vertical studs. And uh, as you'd seen, I put uh, a, a good amount of glue onto those. So now not only are these screws uh, adhering it to those, uh, to, to those studs, but the, the glue is also uh, fastening this, uh, this rather large board to the side of the gypsy wagon. So that in combination with, with the large number of screws that have gone through here, will hold it in place, much like the roof is being held in place by the large number of screws that we have up there and the adhesive. So, so yeah, so then uh, what's gonna happen is, is this is gonna come down and we're going to seal up this area right here with a nice piece of cedar that will run the length of this. That should do that or complete that. And then of course we have our window cutouts, which are going to, it's gonna be three windows in here. Uh, we're going to do that the same way that we did the door and we're going to uh, send a screw through. We're going to cut out the square. We're going to drop the window. We're going to cut out the square. We're going to drop the window in and then uh, mount it. Now it's going to get these, uh, these, these verticals, these studs are going to, in, in the bays where the windows are, like over here, are going to get a, uh, another two by a three at the top of the window and one at the bottom of the window. That's to create sort of a framing of the window, which will make it easier to close in the wall from the inside. And it's also to give the window that much more support in terms of uh, being able to hold on to something that's actually on the inside of the, um, of the plywood. So, uh, so there you go. Now we've got, uh, we've got these pieces left to do, but first I'm gonna repeat this same exact process for the other side. We no longer need these things. We can take those off without risk of this thing coming off because it's been properly adhered to the side of the, uh, the gypsy wagon. Now, another thing is everywhere where these screws have gone in, it, it creates a point of entry for water potentially. So I am gonna go, I have to go back and, and dabble uh, paint rather liber liberally over all of these sort of entry points. Otherwise, that's gonna cause a problem. Again, we wanna seal this as best as we possibly can. So, so those, those spots right there are the weakest chain in the link. If you, weakest link in the chain, there you go. I think that's how it goes. Anyway, on to the other side and then we'll, uh, and then we'll finish closing it up with these once they're painted. This is it, this is the last little bit that we need to close in. Same thing on the other side. I painted the pieces already. We'll get these walls closed up. Then we gotta cut out the windows. Um, front window done. That needs to be screwed in place a little bit more. Mm, and the six side windows, and uh, we're good to go. Oh yeah, oh yeah, that. We gotta do that too. fish around in your pockets for the stuff. So these are all already all in here. So all I have to really do is line everything up up top, get one or two of these screws in, and the rest should uh, be easy, should. What I did is I put these in 
slightly to the lower portion of the middle. So it's in, in the top half of the bottom half, top portion of the bottom half. And what that will achieve is that uh, the screws will go in below the uh, metal. So it'll, uh, the metal will come up to sort of the halfway point to the back of this. And then the screws are underneath that. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna slather on a nice thick layer of sealant onto the back of this thing. We're gonna put glue or construction adhesive more accurately at that point where the, uh, the metal roof touches that, uh, that roofing beam. So when it all gets pressed down, we've got the glue, we've got the, the silicone uh, flex adhesive. The final step of that will be where the metal effectively will be right here. Uh, we're gonna run some more thick uh, sealant along that edge where metal hits this piece of wood to channel the water, you know, to, to one end or the other end. And that's that. It all sounds good in theory, but now I uh, have to make it work in practice, so let's do that. All right, so there you go, there you have it. We're gonna end it up with the uh, gutters up top there to shed rainwater off the front of the back. And that's it. That wraps up putting on the walls. All right, it's dark in here. So let's shed some light on this thing. What I did here is, in all the, the places where the windows are gonna go, I put a two by three up top now. I could have slid the window all the way up, but that was just too high when you're outside. It's too close to the roof line and so forth. So I thought, well, let's drop it down a little bit. So I put a two by three in there, and that's gonna be the height. I would say the window's gonna go in from the uh, outside, come in from the outside like this. So what we need to do now is this, this back dimension here, minus the lip, is what we need to cut out of the plywood because that's what's going to have to pop through the plywood. But then the beauty of this two by three is, is that we already have the top attachment points from the outside done. So all we have to do is drop a, uh, another two by three underneath these windows and then that will take care of the bottom. Yeah, so, so effectively we're just gonna um, we're gonna do the same thing that we did with the door. We're gonna send a couple screws through uh, on the corners of this, connect those lines on the outside, and then uh, proceed with the cutting. So that's, uh, that's the next step. We're gonna do that six times for all six windows. And once we have that done, we have to paint the exposed plywood again to, to protect it, seal it as best we can. Once that's dried, uh, then we can, we can pop the windows in there and be done with it. That's gonna happen with uh, a, a generous coat of silicone as well on the back side of these. Um, when they pop in, that they seal up real nice and tight. see but here's the outline that's what we're doing repeat six times so what I'm probably gonna do is before I start cutting and all that I'm just going to take these screws out mark this middle window mark the front window do the same thing on the other side so that I can uh, you know do this in a more sort of um, what's the word I'm looking for expeditious fashion it's not, it's not what I was looking for, but anyway, you get the idea. Do one process at, uh, at one time, do the next process, which is cutting and so forth. Next is painting, putting the windows in. So we'll do all this in order. And um, yeah, so, you know, next window goes there.
All right, I already very unceremoniously popped in window number one. We're just gonna uh, attach that with like one or two screws at this point. Uh, keep it simple, I just don't wanna lose them. Getting ready for the show. Two more, other side, and we're, uh, we're almost done with this. So I'm back from an awesome weekend up in Massachusetts, United Tiny House Show, continuing the build on the gypsy here. I just put up a couple pieces of trim to surround these windows, cedar, uh, thin down to about a quarter inch. What I'm going to do is now connect these two pieces with a uh, similar size trim, just to, uh, just to really uh, frame out the windows properly. So I'm going to do that. I need six pieces of that. And I'm honored you can't see him right now, but Andrew Bennett from Trekker Trailers is a, there. There he is, right there. Ah! There he is. He's here helping me out this week. <laughs> um, lucky to have this man. Hey guys, helping me out is an understatement. He's uh, he's a legend in his own right. So um, anyway, it's fun. I mean, this is why we do what we do, man. This is why we do what we do. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Oh. The restroom. <laughs> yeah, man. Stand the hall. Street <laughs> hall. Yeah. Hey, there's what happens with video arguments. <laughs> it's a live show. That way you it's know we're show. real. Yeah, yeah, right. it's, it's all real, not <laughs> edited. <laughs> anyway, Andy's working on the um, the uh, the floor on the yeah. inside. We're gonna get that done. He's putting in a vapor barrier, and then we're gonna drop the beautiful um, tobacco acacia. Here it is. There you go. Yeah. yeah. It's gonna look like this. That's gonna look cool. That's gonna look cool, right? So um, we're gonna drop that in once he's done, and uh, yeah. Anyway, here we go. Which is really important for putting the vapor rear down because this type of flooring it gives this susceptible to uh, moisture. This so. this side of it, the side that you don't see, is like a sponge. Yeah. yeah. You want to keep the water away from that. No water on a sponge. It messes it all up. Unless you want, unless you have a sponge. Unless you're looking, yeah. <laughs> a mobile gypsy jacuzzi. Yeah. All right, here we go. All right, jacuzzi. That's cool, man. You should, uh, you should get that domain, Gypsacuzzi. All right, so you saw me using this, this is a brad nailer, finishing nailer. And what it does is it shoots out a really small, let me just, oh, what did I just do with them? Where'd they go? Here they are. It shoots out a really small kind of nail, almost like without a head. And um, this is actually two of them right here. And what this does is, uh, I've used construction adhesive on the back of that trim work. But then I'm putting these through there too, just to fasten it, doubly fasten it in place. These are shot with compressed air through there. The nails are in a sort of a, a they're stuck together kind of, and then each one kind of separates from the rest. Works great. It's great for where you don't want to use like a larger nail or a screw. So, good thing to have. Pretty inexpensive, and I use this a lot both on the exterior and the interior work. So this side in terms of the windows is done. What's next or what I'm going to do is these corners front and back and the way that's going to work is with more of these trim pieces that I created, and they're just going to kind of overlap in such a way that it's gonna cover the corner like that. So that one touches the other, and that creates like just a really, you know, rather clean look for, um, for, the, for the corners, the vertical corners of this build. So, we're gonna need more of these these strips. We're gonna cut down. I got another one more piece of the cedar. I'm gonna cut that down. Still have to do the same trim on the other side. 
And that's basically it. I mean, I could, I might, I don't know yet, um, just add a strip down here as well. It might be good visually to do that, but we'll see. And um, for now, uh, doing this on the other side is priority and the corners. Yeah. All right, so the door's on. Let me walk you through how we made this door. This is mostly Andrew's handiwork right here, but it's pretty simple. You gotta, we, you remember we cut the door opening? So we had that done. That measurement then was transposed onto a piece of plywood. Of course you want to go a little bit less on all sides because it has to fit into the opening. So you want maybe a quarter inch at the bottom, an eighth at the top, something like that on the sides as well. So that became this piece of plywood, an entire piece. But we already knew that we were going to chop it in half for the Dutch door feature here. And what that meant is that we could subtract three quarter inch because we knew that this was going to go in between here. And then another eighth because you had this gap too. So in other words, the ply didn't quite need to be big enough to fill the, the door frame because we knew that we were going to be um, expanding on this. So the, the front of this is Shishugia Bond. It's this, it's this pine. It goes together right here. And you can see, uh, if you look at the bottom of this, you can see that they interlock here. So you got that. And then what we did is we arranged that pine onto the piece of ply. We uh, put construction adhesive between the Shishugia Bond pine and uh, the ply. And then you'll see these screw holes. So instead of running screws through the front of this, we ran screws through the back to um, just pull uh, these, these two things together and hold them in place. Same thing holds true for up there. See a long row of screws up there. Holding this together. Now, on the uh, Dutch door here, you need uh, two sets of hinges. So, four hinges total. Otherwise, a door like this would probably take like three hinges. But you can't get away with doing just one hinge, obviously. So, you do one here, 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 and one down there at the bottom. The hardware we used for this, probably not to be recommended, but it was something that I had around and it was nice, nice, uh, nicely aged. What you probably want to do is want to go with like, some more conventional hardware on something like this, because this was a little difficult to put in. Andrew had to route out sort of a, uh, a space for this. That got it into this pocket right here, as you can see right, right there. And then we backed it up with this um, the secondary piece of ply to cover the, the back of the lock. Um, this is just temporary right here, but this is going to come off. We're going to put a, a, a lip on the back of this so that the, the upper door can never pass the lower door, if you will, but it can move freely, right? Because it's going to need to move freely since when the bottom's closed, you're still going to want to be able to open the top like that. So, so that's how that works. I'm going to do a barrel latch or similar to hold that in place right there so that the top does not open on its own. You pull out a little pin and then the, the top separates from the bottom. Now, the inside of the door frame currently has just this. If we didn't have this here, the door will continue and stress the hinges by going past the point where it's supposed to latch in. So this is just a uh, way of stopping that. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna run, we're gonna run that all the way around the edge of the door. That's going to also create the, um, the seam where we're gonna put the, 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 the weather strip. And that's going to uh, seal off this door on the back. Now, in here, 
Let me back away a little bit. In here, it's not done, but I've started to fill in the, the pockets that are created uh, by way of the framing. On the back, of course, we just have the sheet of plywood. We have these two by fours, kind of holding things together. And then it creates this, this space right here. That's been filled in. I ran the wiring, it saw me do that the other day. I ran that through here. We got the one low voltage line that's going to this switch. The wires behind here um, run up and you'll see it go right there and through here. And then I run that wire along here and I stop right there and have a uh, little loop. The reason for that is when we put the, the when we insulate this, uh, this roofing area, we're still going to want to, well, we're going to cut some holes into the, into the plywood where the lights are going to go, and then we have to find this wire. So this just makes it a lot easier to find. And then we uh, snip through this, we connect the light, and then we push everything back up into, into the, the, the cavity here and then you have your light right there. Same thing's true, this runs all the way around to here. Same thing, then we cross over through this, uh, this top rafter beam and then uh, over here and along this way and it terminates right there. Focus, focus, there we go. It terminates right there because that's gonna be our last light. So I've, I've decided to put four lights into the ceiling. What I'm using, you'll see them uh, shortly, are sort of uh, recessed small flat uh, 12 volt lights. So that's the low voltage stuff. The, the AC voltage continues to run along here, uh, over here, behind this insulation panel, down through there. And then we come up here and that terminates in this outlet. I also ran a low voltage line over here potentially for, an, for a USB, like a USB, what's that called? The, uh, you know, we have, have four USB plugs. So it's also gonna be mounted in the wall most likely. So that's gonna be there. This may or may not be, this area over here may, not, may or may not become a kitchen area. At least that's what I did last time. There might be some sort of storage thing here. And then obviously bed all throughout here. If that's the configuration somebody wants. Somebody could of course leave it like this with the beautiful flooring in there. That turned out really nice. That's uh, tobacco acacia. So that's in. Looks good. We'll have to clean up the sides. So what we're going to do that is we're going to take some thin plywood. Come from, uh, come from down here to the top of this edge. That covers all that up nicely. And then there's going to be, man, words are really failing me today. Then there's gonna be like a, like a toe kick, basically. That runs once around the entire edge, so that'll clean that up. That's about it. So the rest of it, what I gotta do is I gotta clean up, sorry, I gotta fill in these side pockets with some more insulation. Those are all cut to size. Then what's gonna happen is we're going to close up this wall back here completely close this in. Oh yeah, this is worth referencing. So we put these weird uh, blocks in here. Why is that? Because when we put the wall in, there, uh, it's, a, uh, it's like a tongue and groove quarter inch pine, and that pine has to rest on somewhere, right? You can't just have it wiggling it freely in the air here. So that, that tongue and groove is just gonna keep running across here, fully across uh, over there, and we're gonna fill all this in. And what that gets us is this wall closed up. And then what we can do once we have the, uh, the tongue and groove pine on here is put up this first ceiling panel. Now we can put that up and then push it, push it all the way back up against the pine to create a nice tight seam back here. So that's the plan. That first ceiling panel, we've cut them to size. I'll show you that outside. We're already put them under pressure. We're, f we're flexing them because it's gonna have to take on this arch shape. And uh, so that first one is gonna come into the room to the full four feet. So that's gonna end, I don't know, somewhere, somewhere around here. I should really mark that here on the thing because what we're gonna need to do is we're gonna need to figure out 
how far this hole that we got to drill is from uh, over there to here and from here to uh, what's going to be the end of that um, that ceiling board. So then the second board goes in, that's going to be a complete board as well. That's going to take us to over here, over here, and then the same thing has to happen. we got to figure out where, where we're going to cut that hole. And then uh, there's going to be like, I don't know, uh, I guess, let's see, four, four, two. It's going to be like a two foot piece left for, for back here. That is going to make up the, um, the final bit. So. I think I measured uh, three feet from here to, to there. So if the last piece is two feet, so we're gonna come to about here. There we go. And then, uh, and then that last bit is just like one thin strip of it. Hopefully we'll get the seams pretty nice. You know, in the end, it's, it's hopefully gonna look a little bit like this and be you know, nice and clean. Um, if not, we're gonna put a trim strip over it, not a big deal. But yeah, we're gonna do that. Uh, Andrew also uh, put put this all around the window, so this will make it a lot easier for us to line up the um, the uh, tongue and groove pine around all these side windows. And on the front, we're just gonna come up to this edge right here. We're gonna go over this part, and then with a the router, we're just gonna clean up that edge. These little round bits in here, I'm probably just going to paint that black in there and then it'll sort of blend in with the edge of this frame. So that's going to be good. Yeah, that's pretty much that. Uh, let's see what else we got. Another thing that I did was cover these corners. I think I showed that last time already. Got these thin strips. Go around the corner like that, looks like the corner's covered. And then of course, they dressed up the windows here with this angle. And what I did is I, I continued that line down to here and that came to right there. Now these are the, um, this is the ply I was talking about, which is currently being stressed out to take on the shape of the ceiling. The reason that helps is if you take a fresh piece of ply like this and you try to push it up against the, uh, the roof there, it could snap in half. I've, I've done it. It's not the end of the world. You've got to get another piece of ply though. But by doing this, you can already uh, sort of pre-shape it. The other thing you can do is uh, spray some water on this side, which kind of softens it up and that will also help you bend it. So uh, we've actually got the, the three pieces of ply. Um, all together here. Of course, if you're spraying, going to spray water on it or you're going to wet it with a sponge or whatever, uh, you're going to want to do that to each one of these and not do it uh, to all three together. Oh, the other thing I did, yeah, here we go. The, um, the taillights, they were right here. Now, what I didn't like about that was that there's so much distance that's um, covered above here and it made the taillights really hard to see from, um, you know, from, from behind. So I decided to move them back. The only, all I had to do to do that was uh, cut the wire. Well, I took the, the tail light off of here. It's easy, it's just uh, these, these two bolts hold it in place, these two nuts. Take those off, you cut the wire, cut this wire, and you add in another piece of wire, and then you just reconnect it up here. And what I used was were, were these uprights, I wanted it out a little bit more, so I put a piece of the cedar in between there, used this angle, and then just uh, drilled two holes into this angle and remounted it exactly the same way that it was mounted back here. What that gets you is, if we back out a little bit, there's two taillights that are way more visible than they were before. So before, you know, you'd be lucky if you could see one of them. Now you can see both of them if you're behind the trailer uh, and uh, it's just, uh, you know, it's a, it's a safety thing. So there they are. I know I went over a lot of things there. Uh, some things maybe not to the level of detail that you were hoping for. The book does cover some of these things a little bit better than the video does. Uh, but I hope it was helpful nonetheless. Next, we're finishing out the interior to get to sort of a shell state. But I hope this was helpful. and. Bit of a recap here. We have 
now completed the structure. All the framing is done, all the structural stuff is done. I've kind of turned the corner here. We're going from the building part to the finishing part. So there's kind of like two broad sections. There's, there's the part where you're putting together the structure itself, and then there's the part where you uh, turn it into the thing it's ultimately going to become. I had to get certain parts done, like the door, so that was done fairly quickly. Uh, the, uh, with the help of Andrew Bennett from Trekker Trailers. All the exterior trim work. So if you look at this, this uh, Gypsy Wagon uh, Camper Bardo, from the outside at the moment, you will think that it's completed. There's really very little, if anything. The exterior is pretty much done. Let's call it 95% done on the outside. The inside is about 5% done. So definitely gonna paint the walls. And then for the ceiling, um, I've used a darker blue in the past. Um, now we've got the exterior, sort of this evergreen. I was thinking of tying in the exterior color to the ceiling color. By no means making it the same color, but using or uh, utilizing like a shade of green for that as well. So that's where we're at. in. That's going to keep uh, all the um, wood flooring that we're putting in there dry because water's going to splash up from the bottom. You don't want that. So you got to keep that dry. Andrew's going to be putting it, <coughs> putting in this um, flooring here that we should before. This is a, an acacia, tobacco stained acacia they call this. It's an engineered flooring. What that means is that it's actual wood, it's not like a sticker or anything, but it it like makes up the very top layer of this and the rest is just cheap plywood. So you're getting the benefit of having what looks to be sort of a solid wood floor without having a solid wood floor. Plus it's pretty light. It's good for, uh, for a um, home on wheels build like this. And um, yeah, we're just gonna put it right on here because the uh, pressure treated deck was actually pretty pretty flat and straightforward, so it's gonna go straight on to that. Wall to wall, we're gonna run it lengthwise, so that makes the structure look bigger, versus doing it, um, you know, like this. When you have that, when you look into it, it looks like a deeper, longer room. It's a visual trick. So that's it, Andrew's gonna, gonna keep working on that. I'm still working on the exterior trim, and uh, that's how we stay out of each other's way. If you have somebody, if you're lucky enough to have somebody help you, like I, I do today, um, try to stay out of each other's way. All right, all right. So ceiling panels up, two of them. One partial left to do. Roger. Put insulation in here. Roxel. Love the stuff. Yeah. Uh, what is it? Uh, it is right there. There it is. Yes. One little thing left to do here. Oh, this is my wedding song. Good, bad, and the ugly. Walking down the aisle. That'd be funny. Got a little, uh, got a little insulation left to do here. A little over here. And then we're gonna cut this strip to the proper width. Seal this I'm thing up. Listening to you, just kind of going over your head. Oh no, I'm actually recording. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm recording. Hey, hey, hey look at that! No, don't, don't block me out. Wow. All right, back to the business at hand. <laughs> Close this thing up. Get these lights in. If I did everything right, although this was a little bit, we did a little, you know, we did this pretty fast. This light switch right here will actually turn the lights on and off. If it did it wrong, which could nothing <laughs> happens. In which case, we're getting battery lights. Uh, in which case, yeah, I don't know what's going to happen at that point, but um, I'm reasonably confident that that will work. So good. So close this in, and then yeah, here we go. So, 
bit of the rock sole that I need to put in. This stuff's pretty dense. I like working with it um, because it's 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 solid. Like I mean, this stuff it's like a loaf feels like a loaf of bread. And uh, it goes in real nice into these uh, these pockets up here. Just gonna fill them up, and that's that. It's loud today. So Andrew's working on finalizing the store here. With background music. With with dramatic western <laughs> background music. So what he's doing here, he's putting the latch on there. What, what's that one called? What's that type of latch called? Sash. Sash. Sash latch. Oops. Which sounds like Sasquatch, but it's a sash lash. Exactly. And it's the same thing you'd have on your window between the sashes. <laughs> it's true, they're between yeah. the sashes. That's why it's called a sash latch. I know it. And uh, it's one of those spinny things, you know, where it kind of gets tighter the, the more you spin it. Yeah, which is really good on these because you want to be able to maintain the seal. Yes. More so in the north where we are now. Yeah, Andrew's from Florida, so, so, so right. this whole notion of insulation and stuff is kind of... We don't even have doors. ...kind of new to him. And um, the door is trimmed with this. This is a uh, like a weather strip, but it's um, it's like a rubber weather strip. Andrew said he really liked it because it stuck to the wood really well. Because that is not always a given. Ooh. Some of this stuff doesn't stick well. It's got that peel off back. Yeah, that's nice stuff. Some of it just falls right off, which is no good. sidewalls front and back this as well that's going to be painted a color aptly named cozy white which is sort of an off-white you don't really want to use white white or like um, unstained paint you know like just pulling a can of white off the shelf you want to tone it down a little bit the white white uh, I have painted things that color before Arctic white or something is like pretty much as white as it, as, as it gets and it's just like it just looks a little too intense so tone it down uh, pick a pick a more subtle shade of white I know that sounds weird but but yes do that for the ceiling I chose something called cactus garden green something like that I wanted to play off of the exterior color which is clearly also green that's an evergreen, like forest green. This is gonna be a more muted, uh, pale green for the ceiling. I think it'll provide a nice contrast in here. Ultimately, you know, time will tell. Paint's always one of those things where you kind of like, you have to hope you do the right thing. Uh, what I did do is I went with um, satin for the ceiling and semi-gloss for the walls. Uh, what I had previously done is I had gone with a like a, a gloss, I think a gloss for the walls and a gloss for the ceiling. And the gloss on the ceiling really didn't look quite right. Uh, we used a dark color, but it reflected a lot of like if you had a bright light 
it would reflect light sources and things like that. You would see them on, on, the, uh, on the surface of a paint. I didn't want that, so I went uh, with a little bit less shiny for the ceiling. So, um, so yeah, so that's that. These things will have to pop out, which is uh, which should be fine. I don't know why I glued, glued them in already. That was kind of dumb. But yeah, these will come right out and then pop right back in. But I'll paint around those edges. I'll paint all this. I'm gonna do start with the walls because it's easier for me to put like a piece of tape on this arch and a piece of tape on this piece of wood right here. And then I'm just gonna do the walls. That's the bigger surface area. I got a gallon for that. I bought a quart for the ceiling. I hope it's enough. I'm not entirely sure whether a quart is gonna be enough for the ceiling, but whatever, we're about to find out. So here we go. hear me. Yeah, I think we're good. For this first part, I have to get all these uh, nooks and crannies. I don't have a paint sprayer. Probably might make this easier, maybe, I don't know. I'd have to tape off a lot of stuff. Getting in these little these little lines here is, is task number one. And then after that, I'm just gonna roll it. So, um, so you see me go around here and do all these weird lines on here, basically just to get in there because um, the roller won't do it. favorite activities especially with all those nooks and crannies to get to but that's just the way it is so anyway here I go Anyway, it's uh, it's not perfect, 
but you can always touch up paint. That's the beauty of it. It's not a. Um, it's better to use too little than too much. Um, I guess. Although I do tend to paint rather heavily. I'm gonna do the uh, the ceiling with the uh, really nice green that I got, and it's going to look great. Cactus green on the ceiling, that's what it's called. Valspar signature interior paint, that's what I'm choosing from Lowe's. And um, yeah, it's going to do the, uh, the trim work here first before I hit the rest of it with the roller. Hopefully, I won't spill it, it's kind of hard to hold on to it. thoughts around the bed platform. What I'm thinking of doing is putting a 2x4, not this short, but one that runs all the way to the end uh, over here um, and then comes up to this point that I've marked which is the 53 inch mark and that is the, uh, the size of a full-size mattress as I mentioned before. So I'll put that there, essentially cut two of these at 53 inches one on each side and then the platform itself is going to have two by fours on the bottom of it covered by a sheet of plywood that the mattress then goes on top of and then that is going to sit exactly uh, lined up with this particular piece right here we'll probably run a couple two by fours between this uh, piece and the wall as well what that will do is platform will sit very neatly in between this wall and the opposite side. Because of that, there's really no chance for this to shift off of here, right? Because the platform is going to be effectively the width, well, you know, minus probably about a half inch, the width of this wall to the other wall. So what that allows, is it'll allow like a little bit of play in terms of the movement on here, but it will never like sort of slip, can never slip and fall. It's sort of like it's preordained to sit on top of this if I construct it in a way which it does. So that, that's what'll happen. And then the, the front, the front of the whole front of this thing, I will cover, you know, appropriately. So probably from, from here on, because that still leaves us, but that still leaves us this much space, which is probably about 16 inches or so. So whatever, whatever that measurement is, I'm going to try to aim to, to uh, allow for uh, placement of uh, some kind of um, toilet underneath the bed platform. I've looked at a couple of the, the RV toilets and, and you know, getting sort of an average height of those. And, and as long as it's easy to sort of slide under here and slide out from under here, then we're in good shape. Now we've got a lot of the, uh, the wiring which originates uh, under the bed. We've got a battery that needs a home. What I'm thinking of for the battery is that the battery goes all the way back here into the corner, back there, and then gets you know secured into that spot. And the electrical panel will either sit uh, down here or it'll it'll go up right next to the bed up here uh, and sort of be integrated into a kind of a piece of furniture or similar. Odds are it's, it's gonna go up here on this ledge. That's, that's my current thinking. It's just a better place for it in terms of access to these wires, and running those wires. Um, and, and it's easier to, to kind of like hide it back in here and, and, and have it just be situated there, so. All right, I'm just gonna let the video do the talking here. 
This is the uh, the bed platform coming together. I'm putting a bunch of two by fours in for supports. Uh, check out what I do here. If any of it doesn't make any sense to you, I will explain everything that I did and why I did it after you watch this short compilation. bed platform for a second. So this is the bottom of it. The rails that you just saw me install on the inside are going to go underneath this section here. And the same thing holds true for the back. Uh, there's one more piece here because there was, uh, I needed to bridge the two little pieces that go on to the um, back side of this because of full mattress is 53 inches wide. This is a um, uh, four by eight sheet of plywood. That's 48 inches, 53. We're missing uh, five inches on the bottom. Ouch. That's these five inches right here. And um, the plywood is already at like a three quarter. It's pretty thick and strong, but over time it's going to sag. So you're gonna to wanna to support it. I like to do things to the point where I have minimal doubt that anything is going to go wrong with this. And for that reason, I went with one, two, three uh, full length two by fours to run the extent of it. Now there isn't one up front because that would look ugly and I'm probably gonna do more of a trim strip up front because this is going to be the side facing the interior. But this section here is, I don't know what this is, 15 inches or so. I figured that was sufficient. The mattress is gonna disperse um, weight as well. But I'm saying like if somebody um, were to sit on this edge, uh, this stuff is really strong. And then immediately back here, it gets supported uh, with the additional weight, or the, not the additional weight, the additional uh, strength of this two by four. Uh, the other thing I didn't wanna do was, um, drop something down fairly far up front because that limits the uh, amount of space clearance that you have from the floor. And if you're gonna push like a toilet or something like that underneath here, you're going to want that additional space for that to tuck in uh, potentially, theoretically. So that was the thought behind all this. Um, the width should be fine. The length is 53 to mimic the mattress. Um, the, uh, the diameter of the space uh, is like 75, which is the exact dimension of a, um, a full-size mattress in terms of the, the length of it. And um, I cut this platform down to like 74 and a half though, to give it a little bit of breathing room on either side, because you don't want to like scrape up the walls uh, every time you lift this up that you're, that you're going to want to lift it up very often, but um, anyway, that's why I made it um, narrower than the, sp the actual space. So that's it. Let's get this thing in there, and then, and then uh, yeah, we'll see how it fits. We'll see how it sits in there, and that should do it for the day. I'm going to go pick up my daughter. I have gone ahead and put these rails in. Uh, these are 53-inch 2x4s, and they went in to mimic where the rails on the bed platform are. So they're gonna sit on top of this. So then only this 
gap here needs to be bridged and I put two two by fours into the bottom of the bed platform. Again, whether you're doing a twin size mattress, full size, queen size, it's going to change the way that you do this. I don't want to uh, give you exact measurements because it's pointless because you're gonna wanna do something different probably. I used five inch screws to go through the tops of this into here. That held it in place pretty good, but just to give it a little bit more stability, I added these two things. Uh, went in with a four inch screw here, and then in with the three and a half inch screw into there, and these things are not moving, not budging. So as a next step, I'd like to um, drop the bed platform in here and just see how that uh, fits. This thing is not light. Let's get you a better vantage point. never coming out again. I think what we're gonna have to do is that rail makes it too high. So we're gonna have to come off that rail. Okay, that's better. Go onto the rail over here. Alright, these things always pain me a little bit, but yeah, I make mistakes and I think it's important to acknowledge our mistakes um, and I will do so here. So this is the bed platform, conceptually great, you know, exactly the size of a full size mattress, none of that went horribly wrong. And this isn't a huge mistake, but it is a mistake. So what I did is I took this and put it in there. And I wanted to lay it flat onto where the the, uh, the the bed is going to go into the back of the thing. The issue is, for this to go through the door, it has to go through on its side like this. I can't go vertically because it won't fit through the door. And once it's in there, it's so big that I can't uh, maneuver it sideways and then tilt it and then slide it into place onto onto where the, 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 the bed rails that I installed. And the reason for that is, is that once I get it sideways, these corners start to bump into the, uh, the, the bottom of the ceiling. I'm already coming a foot off the floor because I have to get it onto the, um, the bump outs. And then it's up too high and, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out whether this is just an issue of like I need an extra person to help me with this but uh, it's it's not uh, two people wouldn't help for this particular situation so I had to come up with a plan B I left this uh, as it was yesterday my initial plan was to cut these corners out of this plywood just these two corners thinking that this little extra bit here might be enough for me to get it into place. I don't think it is. So my plan B is what I'm going to do is I'm going to mark the edge, the front of this 2x4 on the top on, on, on the other side. And uh, I'm going to, with the, um, with the skill saw, the circular saw, just cut uh, along that line that I put there. And what that will do is that will cause this whole front piece to, uh, to come off. At that point, it's going to be, whatever that is, about 15 inches uh, shorter. That will make it really easy for me to get it into place. Then what I have is this front piece with these two pieces attached to it still. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, secure it across the top with a... Um, with a uh, like a bridging plate like this. So that'll go on, on top. That will hold the front to the, to the back piece. And then I'm going to give this, uh, this, this piece support, because right now it's attached to you know, these pieces of type plywood. This is one continuous piece. When I cut it, it's gonna weaken this piece, and particularly because there's no support along here. 
What I'm gonna do at that point is, hold on, is put like two of these blocks under here. It's gonna get drilled from the bottom, so that's going to make this not want to go anywhere. And I'll put two, you know, one there and one over here. And then whatever pressure you put on this from the other side will be counteracted by, by having this brace under here. That is how we're gonna do it. So, not terrible, it'll take me about, well, let's call it a half hour to fix this issue. screws out on this little plate and uh, run a rather large screw through there going into the top of this and then I'm going to go through the back of this uh, lower 2x4 into this block and that will seal the deal and I'll uh, run one more in probably a little further up front so it's going to be like this on the underside and that is going to uh, give this all the hold that it needs. I mean, even with this little plate here, it might actually be sufficient, but um, you know, because we've got a mattress on here, it's not like you're gonna put 500 pounds like on this one square inch of the uh, uh, bed platform. You know, even if you take a large weight and you put it on top of a mattress, that mattress is going to just uh, burst that weight across a much larger larger section of, uh, of the platform itself. So, not too concerned. Happy with the solution. Yeah, I'm just gonna get this plate, uh, this piece in place from, from the underside. And then, uh, then we've got this, uh, we've got, it's a wrap. Let me get the uh, proper screw for this. And call it a day. Quick overview.
overview of the underside, no pun intended. Uh. All right, a little bit more by way of explanation here. You're looking at the underside of three IKEA cutting boards. Now I opted to use those because I didn't want to buy a big chunk of butcher block. So you got three cutting boards that are pieced together. You see the holes of the cutting boards at the top edge there. And um, I'm just starting to frame this out so you're looking at the underneath, but I wanted to just kind of explain a little bit better what, what, what this is. Of the kitchen counter. So you're looking at the bottom of the kitchen counter and what I'm starting to do is frame out what the underside is gonna look like as it goes there. So this side goes right up against that wall over there. And then the back of it, which is that, runs flush against the, the back wall. And then on the side, we're leaving an inch and a half, or I'm leaving an inch and a half uh, space overhang. And the same on the front, inch and a half there. And then these pieces I just put in here as sort of placeholders because that's where the legs uh, are going to wind up. And those legs are gonna get measured uh, from one, two right there. Those are the uh, the ones coming up from the, the, the non-cropped out section. And then um, two, sorry, three, four for the back. So those back ones, that's that one and that one, are gonna be shorter than the front ones because the front ones are going all the way to the floor and the other ones are just going onto that um, outcropping. So what we need to do is we need to accommodate for the lack of rise in the back and make them shorter by exactly the uh, the amount that this is right there. The um, I think it's 13 and a half or, the, or thereabouts. So four sets of legs, two of them are gonna be 13 and a half shorter than the other two legs. Yeah, and that's about it. And these holes I'm not too worried about. One's gonna get covered with a faucet or similar and you know, it's just gonna, just gonna kind of work out that way. I'm not cutting the hole for the sink yet. That can wait. It's basically got to fit in here, but that should be fine. Actually, I'm sorry. Wait. Yeah, I've got this. I've got this the wrong way. Actually, I'm gonna, I need to slide this over. This actually needs to be moved over. We're gonna go here. That's going to slide over. That's going to slide over something like that there we go now if you were to flip this like this that end up and over then you get that overhang edge over on this side and the front lip on this side so that's what we want right and then that puts the sink over here because again it's like that this is the bottom of it yeah, that's pretty much it. So the trick with these is going to be to glue them onto the board and then not just glue them, but also drive a screw through here. So this is, uh, what are we looking at? Two and a half inches here. And then uh, that's about three quarters of an inch. So we want like a two, a three inch screw basically. A three inch screw will, will get into the, uh, into this board far enough to hold on to it, but not come out the top. So um, three inch screw through here, and we'll sink it a little bit, and that way we'll get you know pretty close to the to the top edge of the board. That'll get it a nice grip, we'll glue it, we'll glue all the other stuff, and that's that. And then for these, um, we're going to drill uh, through, sorry, run a screw through here, so that we're attaching it to here. And then ideally we run another screw. Yeah, we might we might do like a little bit of an angled screw from here into here, and then go straight through from this part into this one, just to hold all that together. Again, these are placeholders. Ignore these. These do not uh, mean anything. But that's how we're doing it. Now on some tables, like you may have seen, like sometimes people will cut like a 45 degree angle, they'll put a little bracket in here, and then you can run a screw 
through a piece like this and into the corner and that holds it nice nice and tight but um, yeah I'm not going to be doing that most likely because it cuts into your space there a little bit as well especially maybe over here I'm not sure how, how large this thing's going to be but it's going to be something like that could be running into a problem over here potentially or in that corner with the faucet next up is cutting out the hole for the kitchen sink <clears throat> kitchen sink looks like that it is yes it's a salad bowl um, what I did is I traced out the exterior uh, edge of this and then I traced a, a second circle just slightly on the inside of that then I uh, taped out the um, the line so you can you can see the line right along the edge of the tape that's the inner circle because you want that lip to sit on the um, this lip right here to sit on there and sort of drop in yeah I'm either gonna cut this out with the jigsaw or I'm gonna use the uh, router I'll expand these holes a little bit maybe I'll do a circle cutter because that'll give me enough room to get the router in and then I'll pretty much just follow the tape if I stay on the inside of the tape I'll be fine might have to do a little touch up but that's gonna be the way that I go it's gonna make it real dusty in here but you know it's already it's already dusty in here so yes I could take this out but it's got the weird short back leg and then I'd have to balance it on maybe I could balance it on the on the sawhorses let me give that a try beats creating all, all that extra dust in here all right so it turns out the uh, the router is not gonna cut deep enough into there the, the router attachment that I have is switch faucet actually it's gonna sit right here and then the uh, water is gonna go into the sink in this fashion so that's uh, being delivered later this week I think we're good here we can continue putting the rest of this thing together uh, in the intro cool
Okay, as usual, it's an awful lot of information to impart in just a few minutes, but uh, the book goes into some additional detail, and I think between the video and the book, you should be able to piece this kitchen cabinet together. Here we go, moment of truth. It's come to be that time where we cut out two more windows, one here, like this one, and one over here, like this one. And they're gonna be in an absolute straight line. If I did it right, they are, they will be. Or rather, they are. I've marked them out with pencil based on the bottom of this frame. And then you see this kind of will go up here like that and the same thing over here so yeah those are in line distance between the end and uh, this, this piece is uh looks, looks about right a tape measure no i'll double check that that oh yeah there's a tape measure so this is about the same four and a quarter yeah four and a quarter these holes because the walls are already closed up behind there. There's a wire. There's a wire that runs through this wall to, to connect that other outlet. So the safest way that we're going to do this is obviously to unplug the power to the trailer. And then what we're going to do is we're going to use a circle cutter. We're going to go in in the middle. Is that right? Yeah, we're going to use a circle cutter in the middle. And then we're going to use the router to make an ever larger circle. And then once we get up towards the pencil line, we're going to be just very careful to, to make it nice and round. Really the best way that I can figure to do this, uh, what will happen at that point is we will have taken the circle of plywood out. There will still be the insulation that's behind there. We can make sure that any wiring gets moved out of the way. And what we will do at that point is we will drill a small hole from this side through the wall on the inside here 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 and then we're going to use the same template on the other side of the wall based on those holes to figure out what we need to cut out on that side and if all that goes well we'll have a nice hole cut out just like the one we have in the door of course the door one was a lot easier because, yeah, you didn't have that gap, you didn't have like the exterior wall, the interior wall. You just had like one solid piece of wood that you had to go through and that made the whole thing, yeah, pretty easy. This I was worried about, but I think this is what the method I'm most comfortable with. Going in like this, kind of surgically with the, the circle cutter, making sure everything's fine in there. And then doing an ever expanding circle that part's a little, going to be a little bit delicate. We're going to have to do it slowly and with a very steady hand with the router. Just cut you right here. And um, so there's no bearing on this on this router, which means it'll just cut. Like if I went, I could like slice, like slice the wall up if I want with this thing. So it's going to be a it's going to be a you know precision job with this router to create as close to a perfect circle as I can. There's a little bit of a uh, fudge factor there because the um, if we go ever so slightly beyond the, uh, the circle, it will be covered by this and it will look like a perfect circle. And on the inside, well, on the inside it has to be pretty accurate as well. What I want to do is once we have that gap, effectively, that's going to be like this wide, I want to take a piece of uh, plastic trim, bend it into that circular shape, and then that'll hopefully smooth out any remaining irregularities. Uh, I'm trying to see if I have a better way of explaining what I want to do. No, I don't. Do I? 
holding up the uh, trim ring on the inside, tracing it out, then cutting that. That's the best we can do. And then, yeah, we just have to try to create a clean edge on that somehow. And that's a little TBD, but we'll, we'll figure it all out. Everything is possible. That's it, windows are cut out. You do the same thing on the other side. You pop the pet peak windows onto the openings, clean up the inside a little bit, the windows in, and you're done. The house is pretty much built at this point. If you followed it along this far, awesome. If you have plans to build your own uh, based on this, then I'm humbled that, that that's the, uh, the end result of this. There are a couple aspects of the house that I still wanted to cover in this final episode. They're mostly uh, decorative and some things that were just simply skipped over on the video side versus the book. Specifically, I have some video content on the headboard design for the uh, bed area, clearly. Here is what's going to happen. I've cut this to approximately 53 inches in length. This right here was a scrap piece of wood. That didn't stop the lumber mill from charging me a lot of money for a scrap piece of wood. But this would have been a real shame to like toss out because it's quite stunningly beautiful. I believe it's black walnut. It's going to make a fantastic headboard. The plan is this. I've marked out roughly incremental spaces on here. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drill holes into the bottom of this approximately, oh, I don't know, about that deep, about an inch and a half deep. And then I'm gonna take this copper tubing and put a, I don't know, about an eight or nine inch section of it into each one of those holes. And then that's going to sit at the head end of the mattress. And then to make it super easy, I'll probably uh, just drill a hole through here and then just mount this right into the wall and then that way it's one screw to take the thing off. actually in part a little bit what I'm going for in there.
Uh, then I said I was going to talk a little bit about the table. Again, I like to use Live Edge for this. And I use a, um, a boat mount, basically. So if you've ever been on a boat, sometimes you see those tables that you can actually like pull up out of the floor. It's like on a single post. And the, um, the fitting is actually recessed into the floor of the boat. And the nice thing about that, too, is you can use whatever tabletop you want. Um, I typically like to use a nice piece of live edge slab and then just, you know, do it that way. All right, and finally, last but not least, the planters. They, uh, they go on the outside. Uh, very simply, I use this decking material uh, that's available at Lowe's. It is a, how thick is it? I guess it's about three quarters thick, five and a half inches wide. And yeah, and, and what I do with that is I just, you know, cut it into these um, rectangular strips. I use a circle cutter and uh, cut out the holes for it. I cut two little triangle pieces and I just mount it right there on the back of the gypsy wagon, typically right below the two back windows on the sides of the door. Yeah, the little metal pots come from Ikea. I think they're like 99 cents a piece. Now I've used uh, artificial flowers because, well, they tend to be a little bit easier to care for. Uh, but I've also used like, you know, succulents and cacti and things of that nature. So yeah, so that's, um, that's the extent of those. And perhaps uh, with the planters, we, we can put this series to rest. I hope it's been helpful for you. I appreciate any and all of the comments and likes that people have given me on this. It's really rewarding to put something out there and then get that kind of feedback on it. So thank you for that. I hope it continues to help people. Hopefully it'll be just as relevant 10 years from now as it is now. So thank you. Um, hit the like button, share it. This video series, it's all, uh, it's all one big long playlist at this point. And please hit subscribe because there's more stuff coming. I got uh, plenty left to do and uh, I'm working on that uh, bus conversion right now, so go and check that out if you're interested. That's it. Goodbye from Tiny Industrial. Mm -hmm.